Nice, nice. I know there are a lot of people outside enjoying this day, and I know they're part of you. Each of you wants to be out there <laughs> enjoying this day. But we're, we're going to get started, and um, I know you're going to love this program. So welcome to day two of Research America's 28th National Research Forum. I know many of you, and lovely to see you, and I look forward to making new acquaintances. I'm Mary Woolley, President and CEO of Research America, and I'm excited to open a stimulating program. Thank you for joining us, and if you are a member of Research America, thank you for your continuing commitment and support, and the opportunity to work with and learn from you. Yesterday, the first day of the forum, was tremendous by all reports and um, coverage. Uh, we talked about key medical and health research topics, ranging from mental health to the IRA, trust in science, to workforce issues in research and science and technology, and many high content sessions with people like the FDA commissioner, Rob Califf, the chief medical officer of Sanofi, Dr. Dietmar Berger, powerful personal story from Ross Paulson, the COO of Us Against Alzheimer's, and so much more. We were honored and are honored collectively over these two days to have nearly 200 speakers and 16 elected officials whom you can see on the screen, I believe, yes. Um, and now we're gonna keep the straight talk going. Today we value the opportunity to present a rich program with leaders from across the science and technology and health ecosystem. We're grateful to our sponsors and partners for supporting our event. You can see them all on the slides. So our thanks to our lead sponsor, Sanofi, our principal sponsors, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, our collaborating sponsors, AdvaMed, the American Society for Microbiology, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Colgate, ASI, Elsevier, GlaxoSmithKline, Horizon, Eli Lilly, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, Regeneron, and Takeda. And our event sponsors, NVG, LLC, Pharma, Subject Matter, Kivit, and Ultragenics. We very much appreciate the opportunity to be with you here at the George Washington University in the beautiful Jack Morton Auditorium. Thank you to GW for being gracious hosts and showcasing some of the research programs you are engaged in. With that, I will turn the podium to Dr. Pamela Norris, Vice President Research, of research, vice provost, excuse me, of research and professor for mechanical and aerospace engineering at the George Washington University. Pam. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the George Washington University. I want to thank Research America for its long history of advocacy on behalf of biomedical and public health research. I also want to thank you for assembling this very impressive group and for organizing such a wonderful program over these two days. I really enjoyed the programming yesterday. Forums like this are critical so that we can all come together, discuss this current state, and plot a path forward together. I know you all come with different points of view representing nonprofits, industry, government, and academia, and we all need to be in dialogue because the solutions to the world's most pressing problems will require us to work across disciplines, across institutions, and across geographic borders. GW strength comes from being a comprehensive university from our long-standing expertise in law, policy, and international affairs, a leading academic medical enterprise, a commitment to STEM, a culture of creativity and innovation, 
and increasingly by working together across fields. In addition to the groundbreaking contributions of faculty in the Milken Institute School of Public Health, the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and the School of Nursing, GW scholars in the arts, humanities, social sciences, and STEM are exploring the human and societal impacts of medical advances and technologies. We are preparing future lawyers, ambassadors, and business leaders to be fluent in issues that are rooted in science, and vice versa. We are giving future clinicians, scientists, and academics some advanced skills in management, business, communications, and policy. GW is home to more than 35 cross-disciplinary research institutes. For example, we have long-standing institutes on computational biology, neuroscience, and global women's issues, among others. And more recent, initiatives such as the Global Food Institute, our Racial Equity Institute, and Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence. All of these span multiple disciplines, and all of these reflect our institutional priority. Our Biostatistics Center, which is part of Milken, is having a large impact on the prevention and treatment of diabetes by coordinating the design and analysis of large clinical trials. GW researchers are leading the DC Center for AIDS Research. This center collaborates with virtually every academic institution in DC, as well as community health organizations. The Fitzhugh Mullen Institute focuses on development of the health workforce with an emphasis on health equity. It draws on the expertise of faculty from most of our colleges and schools. The School of Medicine has established a center of excellence in cancer and is building centers of excellence in brain sciences and cardiology as well. These centers are informed by cutting edge research and will integrate clinical care, access to novel therapies, and broad educational programs. The university also has established an office of clinical research that is advancing GW's clinical and translational research portfolio. As a result, we are already le leading and seeing successes in vaccine development and testing. Another recently launched institute envisions an evidence-based response to mitigate the climate crisis and equitably improve public health. The Climate Health Institute is using ga data gathered by NASA satellites to map air quality at the neighborhood level. The Antibiotic Resistance Action Center aims to find out-of-the-box solutions to combat so-called superbugs through groundbreaking research, creative public outreach, and policy analysis. A $12 million project within the School of Nursing is designed to help patients with kidney failure understand their treatment options. A number of faculty are also innovating biomedical devices. Researchers in our biomedical engineering department just recently published a study on a device that monitors and treats heart dysfunction before dissolving safely into the body. And still other faculty are advancing strategies for saving lives and preventing traffic injuries around the world. These are just a few examples of the impactful work being done at GW. But we know we can't do it alone. We are actively seeking ways to expand these efforts beyond the borders of our campus, to engage policymakers and practitioners, to partner with entities that can ampl amplify the impact and help translate original scholarship into action. So in that spirit, I want to invite each of you and the organizations that you represent to join us. Whatever your focus within the health and medicine arena, there's likely a member of G the GW community that is eager to share their expertise with you and to collaborate. Please contact me directly if I can help facilitate those conversations. Thank you very much for convening here today. And again, welcome to GW.
Thank you again, Pam, and all. thank you to all of your colleagues at GW. And we're going to take you up on that invitation. <laughs> um, it, it'll happen. So our first session today, our first panel discussion session, is AI in drug discovery and development. And what does pressing forward mean? I'm sure we've all been thinking about AI, maybe worrying about it but the opportunities may very well outweigh any negatives along the way. We'll find out, we're gonna take a deep dive. Um, on the panel today will be Dr. Tala Fakuri, Associate Director for Policy Analysis at the Office of Medical Policy and Initiatives in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Jacob Kostal, Director for the MS Environmental and Green Chemistry Program here at the George Washington University. Research America Board Member, Dr. David Rees, Executive Vice President for Research and Development at Amgen. And moderating this session today, we're so pleased to have with us William Brang Brangham, Correspondent and Producer for PBS NewsHour, and you'll recognize his voice, his voice right away. William, <laughs> over to you. That's a lot of pressure. I've got to make my voice recognizable. Uh, I also feel like I should get a doctorate or something with this esteemed <laughs> crowd here. Uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll uh, forgive me. Um, we're talking about here artificial intelligence. And as any of you who have been paying attention to the headlines and saw the development of ChatGPT and how that suddenly thrust itself upon the world, there's been an incredible amount of, I would argue, overheated rhetoric. I mean, some people talk about this as an extinction level event, the arrival and advent of uh, artificial intelligence. Others think that this is overheated and that we have gotten way beyond ourselves. I saw one public intellectual recently describing artificial intelligence as the arrival of an extremely intelligent alien species and that we didn't know what its intentions really were. And so for this conversation today, we're gonna to try to keep it out of the realm of science fiction and talk very practically about what AI can be used for with regard to developing drugs. And we know that this is a critical public policy issue. The, the, the creation of vaccines and pharmaceuticals uh, has transformed the world and has saved countless lives. And the idea that there is a technology that could help speed that process, help make that process safer and more efficient, uh, and perhaps even, God forbid, bring the cost down uh, would be remarkable. And so that's what we're here to talk about, and the three of you have perfect expertise for this. And so, Jacob, I would, I, I'd love if you could give us a, a lay audience here. Just help us very basically understand the ways in which AI could be used for drug development. Sure. So, so this is narrow AI, so that's not your doomsday scenario, general AI that's gonna annihilate the population. So very narrow application of, of AI. And probably it, it, we should start with some definition of what AI is or what AI we wanna talk about because AI is very loosely defined and I think it, it technically can uh, uh, include a lot of older in silico modeling approaches uh, which can be made adaptive in their learning. So I think we, we should be focusing on, on sort of the deep learning, the neural nets aspect of AI. Um, so in terms of boundary conditions, how you would want to apply it in, in drug discovery sort of responsibly, um, you need, for whatever the application in drug discovery, you need big data. And that's, that's self-evident because there are big data models. But it doesn't only, only mean that you need a lot of data. You also need data that's of sufficient quality and sufficient diversity in the response. And sufficient diversity and amount is Generally speaking, we can get to that, but it's the quality that's the limiting factor because that's the contradiction. If you have a lot of data that you need, it's much harder to evaluate the quality of that data. And AI suffers from the same issues as all other predictive models, garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed it bad data or poor quality data, you're gonna get poor quality predictions, which if you have played around with big language models like ChatGPT, you will Happens find it Happens all the time. Yes, it just, with a lot of confidence, it gives you a nonsensical answer. So that can happen to narrow, narrow AI applications as well. I know a bunch of people that are that way. <laughs> yes, 
Well, we train the model. So there's a human element that projects into these, uh, into these computational models. Um, so you need this. And then I would say the other thing that you need is you need the relationship between the inputs and outputs in the model to be complex so much so that you can't apply uh, simpler models. So like linear models, which will be much more transparent and much more interpretable than AI is. Um, so inputs, outputs, just to define that. So in drug discovery, this inputs would be whatever definitions of your biochemical system and outputs would be the observations of the adverse outcome at either the, the chemical level, the cellular level, or the organism level. And the third one is actually economic viability. You, you wanna make sure that these models are useful, that they right. lower costs, either economic costs or ethical costs in, in some way. So once you have these boundary conditions, then you can start looking at where in the, I mean, for me, where I, what I can talk competently about is the upstream of the discovery when you're actually finding a molecule of uh, therapeutic interest, so. David, what, were you, what would you add to that? I mean, you work at Amgen, obviously the, the discovery of new and useful pharmaceuticals is critical. How does AI play a role in what you're doing? Well, first of all, it's a, you know, we exist for one reason, which is to try to develop good drugs for bad diseases. And AI, you will find in the course of this conversation, I'm an enthusiast. I think it will be the most powerful tool we've ever had. It's a tool, it's not a panacea, but it's a tool that allows us to do the three or four basic things that we need to do for drug discovery and drug development and do them better. What do we need to do? First, the hardest part, we need to understand human biology. The complexity of human disease, what's the normal state, what goes wrong to produce a disease. And based on that understanding then, how can you interdict to actually have a therapeutic effect, right? That's very simple to state. It's very, very hard to do. So let's take a, a real-time example within the last 24 hours of an advance. So some of you may have heard DeepMind um, came out with a, a new program called Alpha MissSense that surveyed the 70 million variants. I'm not saying mutations, but I'm saying variants in the human genome to say which of them are bad actors, meaning are associated with disease, which are benign, or just a variant that occurs but has no effect. That's actually the majority. And then which, uh, or actually the majority is which are unknown. We call them in genetics variants of unknown significance. It's a change that's not normally found in the genome, but we don't know if it's got any functional implications or disease implications. And so this program, which is a form of artificial intelligence, tries to predict whether it's a bad actor or not. Well, what does that give you? That gives you a great starting point to now try to understand disease on a much more fundamental level because you have an experiment of nature that has been going on for now hundreds of thousands or millions of years in primate evolution. So it's a starting point that's much further along than we had before. Now we're then using artificial intelligence to say, okay, let's say we use all of that and we come up with a protein that is a target for a drug. We're now using it for molecular engineering. How do you design a drug that will do to that target what you want it to do, and then just as importantly, not do other bad things <laughs> that you don't want it to do, i.e. produce side effects. Uh, and then finally, in the clinical realm, you know, there'll be enormous uh, applications, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, in healthcare in general, you know, getting people out, under the, you know, out from under the mountains of paperwork. For us, FDA submissions, um, you know, we have a prototype now that will write one of the modules of a standard FDA filing uh, that normally takes an army of people hundreds or thousands of person hours to do, it can now be done in a few seconds. So it's designing drugs and filling out forms simultaneously. A, a, a really good first draft. Now there has to be human intervention and checking. It's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. 
uh, and it's a great place to start. So I, I could go on for the entire 40 minutes, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to well, you. Well, Tala, I wonder what you would add to that. I mean, are, do you come down as an, I mean, I know you're, you're responsible in some way for helping the government keep an eye and understand what we're doing here and, and making sure these drugs are safe and useful and all of the things that we care about. What would you add to that? Yeah, I'd say that we also share the enthusiasm and we think that um, AI can be used in great ways to expedite the development of effective and safe drugs. AI is not new to the FDA. In fact, last year we published a landscape analysis looking at the number of submissions that we've received with AI components. Since 2016, we've received over 300 submissions in areas that the FDA regulates, but also just sharing the enthusiasm of the applicants in areas that we don't regulate. So they'll mention that they've used AI to discover a certain molecule, um, and then that's, that would be outside of what we would typically look at, uh, but then that molecule or that drug would enter the traditional clinical um, trial phase uh, for a drug approval. So it was part of the process, not, not right. the entire process. Right, it's a part process. of the process. And we see it um, you know, being used in, in many different ways in new areas to the FDA and to drug development, like analysis of real world data for drug approvals. But also we've received um, submissions, we've had meetings around the use of digital twins uh, to reduce the number of patients that you would have, for example, in a placebo arm. These are all new and exciting ways that if the technology is used responsibly, ethically, uh, there's the level of transparency that we would expect. Um, we find that really interesting and we're very hopeful that we're gonna see more and more submissions that would help expedite the development of drugs that are terribly needed. Jacob, well, again, I, I don't mean to be focusing on the thumbs up, thumbs down aspect of this, but where do you come down on this? Do you see this as a, as a net positive? Mm. I guess I'm the self-nominated skeptic. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, no, we use AI in the lab, and I, I, I think it's, it's like, like David said, it's a tool. Yep. So you have to understand the applicability of that tool, and you have to understand uh, where it can do harm and where it can do good. I think my major criticisms, just kind of broadly with AI, is that the relationships that I describe for deep learning between the inputs and outputs, the way they are trained, the way the uh, neural nodes optimize the thresholds and the weights and all that, that's very transparent. But the final network is pretty inscrutable. So, and this is critical if you're, for example, trying to figure out whether a particular xenobiotic elite for a drug compound may bind a specific target because that relationship, the, the properties of that potential drug to that binding phenomenon, that's guided by, by biochemistry. That's guided by principles we understand that have been derived from observations of natural phenomena. AI doesn't do that. AI takes a lot of data and tries to mimic those relationships. So it will be always dependent on the data that you feed it. So if you don't have enough data or the data is not of sufficient quality, the outcomes coming out of that can be very variable. Right? So there is a danger in that. Uh, but there are a lot of applications where I think it, it's, um, you know, it, it's clearly very promising because we have a lot of reliable data to train AI on. And, and that's complementary to what David was saying. Uh, whenever you start finding a, a compound that may have a therapeutic interest, you mine some libraries, some repositories. Now, uh, one of them, Zinc, is a, is a popular place uh, where you can find- Zinc. Zinc, where you can find uh, purchasable compounds. I remember when I was a grad student in 2002, um, the, um, the library had maybe less than a million compounds. Now it has in a few billion compounds, so it has grown exponentially, so that's 10 to the nine. But our entire chemical space that we can potentially explore based on building blocks and processes that we have is roughly 10 to the 60. So that's 10 to the 60, you know, over 10 to the nine, so 10 to the 51. Vast majority of the chemical space is unexplored that could be potentially useful there is no way to do this experimentally, just cost and time. So AI trained on existing reaction pathways, existing mechanisms can do a lot of good in this area. Jacob raises a really important point, which is all, Mother Nature is the ultimate arbiter. 
we have to go back into the laboratory. She will let you know if you have made a mistake. Yeah, and it does so every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we fail nine times out of ten, uh, so, so, so we're familiar with that uh, outcome. But what it can help us do is cut down the cycle time, the, the iterative number of experiments we need to do. Now, now let me make that concrete. You know, a, a simple example, let's say we want to develop an antibody against the disease target. So you know, we can make antibodies as well as anyone in the world. And, and the traditional way to do this, meaning what we did up until a couple years ago, <laughs> was generate five or 600 antibodies in a panel and then begin screening them in the laboratory to determine which ones have the molecular attributes, the characteristics that you want. And usually you then get that down to a handful or a half dozen, uh, and ultimately you pick the one that you think will have the best chances of succeeding in the clinic, the so-called clinical candidate. Now that requires a cycle of experimentation, analyzing the data, modifying the antibodies, refining them, experimenting again. And that's a lengthy That's period. a lengthy process, sometimes takes years. And so with artificial intelligence, what we did was we said, we want to create a discovery approach that unites what we call the dry lab, in other words, the computer, so computer engineering with those wet lab experiments. And the whole goal is simply to cut down the number of cycles you need to do until you get to the clinical candidate. And we now know we can do it in probably well under half the time. Uh, and get a molecule that's of higher quality. Wow. So again, you're using that tool to get to the same end, but you're now doing it much more efficiently. Why does that matter? Well, the patient with a serious disease is waiting. And if we can take a year or two off that preclinical timeline, that's a year or two more quickly that we can get the drug to the patient. And, and Tala, you, you were gonna say? I was gonna say, this is, for, this is a great use of the technology. And this is where um, experimentation is important from our point of view. These molecules will then have to enter the traditional phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials where you're doing the safety efficacy assessments on um, participants, on humans, on patients. AI right? does not shortcut that process. So it might shortcut the, the priors before entering clinical research or even non-clinical research, but then it might also make processes during that time more efficient. Going back to it's just another tool, it is a very powerful tool, but what I keep saying our standards, the evidentiary standards, do not change because you're using a new technology. We still have the same standards regardless of whether you're using AI or any other algorithm or technique. Um, so this is, this is a part of the hype of that it is another tool in the toolbox and it can you know cut the the time of drug development tremendously um, as long as it's done right going back to the issue of the data the data that <coughs> feeds into you know training these models depending on the specific application of ai and we've been focused on drug discovery but there are also applications in clinical research where the quality of the data is critical, right? You have to understand the data that you've used to train the model to make sure that it's representative of your intended patient population. You're not introducing uh, bias into the estimates that you're producing. So you have to have a level of understanding of how these technologies were developed um, so that we can feel comfortable also on our side when we're evaluating applications with uses of AI that we're also making the right decision. How do you see the, how, I mean, it, it sounds like you're asking of the pharmaceutical companies, you have to show us your work in the sense of we need to understand how you got to the models, you're doing that. How does that work though with so, the artificial intelligence? Usually in a typical um, application process, we would have access to, for example, um, relevant patient level data. We, would, we can ask questions about the algorithms to better understand their performance. We can have these discussions in different types of regulatory meetings uh, to better understand how the technology is being used, the data that was used to train it. Um, that does not, change whether you've used AI or some other technique. So we're, we're already doing that type of work. We're just seeing more efficient applications of, of AI 
Yeah, the efficiency component is what's critical here. Yeah. So we're using it in our clinical trials, not design of the trials, but also simply implementation. The single largest line item in my multi-billion dollar a year budget is late stage clinical development. These trials are incredibly costly to run. 80 to 90 percent actually don't enroll on time, whether they're industry or Late academic. stage clinical development is what? These are the big trials that we will ultimately use as the mainstay of the submission to the FDA or other regulatory authorities for approval uh, of a drug. So we're using uh, an, uh, an AI algorithm now to actually predict the sites and investigators who are most likely to enroll to a trial. Uh, and we now have internal data that, that tell us that sites selected using that algorithm are about two and a half more times efficient than those selected through our traditional screening process. That is an enormous, it is a staggering difference. Uh, it means you can complete that trial, potentially in the case of some trials, which are, you know, may, may have thousands or tens of thousands of patients, years earlier again, so that the patient benefit uh, on the end is getting that drug much, much earlier. So uh, again, it's across the spectrum. It's how, how you choose to use the tool. And so, these, you know, these algorithms are also in devices, right? That or medical devices, but could also be just in digital health technologies where it's not necessarily a device per se, where you could do decentralized trials. <coughs> you could reach participants where they are and do, you know, you could have a wearable. Hmm. Um, or you could measure their blood pressure while they're home, and AI is a part of that collection of the data. So there, the uses are just across the spectrum of drug discovery and development. There's also uses in post-market safety surveillance, being able to detect safety signals in large data sets. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm personally very enthusiastic about the, the use of the technology, and I think it really has um, great potential. Yeah, I think on the safety side, it, it's going to be incredibly important because what we all struggle with is the, you know, the classic signal and noise problem. When, when you have relatively rare events, is it something real and associated with the drug, or is it just something happening randomly uh, as part of the, what happens in the background in this patient population? Uh, and so I think these tools, as we go forward and learn how to use them, will be really helpful in analyzing those data sets and, and giving us insights into, is this a real safety issue or not? Yeah, I mean, in some sense, if it's, you know, if it's being used and it's working to an extent, because you have the validation at the end there to confirm that it's generating reasonable results. That's um, right. Just for context, I would add, though, that every drug, right, every API that comes out the other end, and we talked with Tala about this a little bit before the, the session, has a lot of intermediates that are used in the discovery of that molecule. And those intermediates may not make their way to the public, that they make their way to the workers. And the, the control over the adverse outcomes of these intermediates is, is very different, I would argue much looser than the control over the API. And in those cases, in silico problems are all, all, you know, usually the pretty cost-effective way of handling it. And then I think we have to be much more careful what model we apply yeah. and how we validate that model because the model may be the only thing that's making those estimations, those predictions. And if there is subsequent testing, say, on the hazard side of things, then it may not be for all the chemicals or it may be first guided by the in silico prediction. So, um, you know, there is, and, and of course, that's still within the, the, the realm of drug discovery. If we step into, my lab works on a lot of, other bioactive compounds like pesticides, and you know we deal with a host of other issues. So as far as protecting public goes from unintended hazards, I think we have to uh, apply high level of scrutiny to, to all these models. Yeah. And as Stella said, it doesn't really matter what the model is. I think we should have a harmonized, rigorous scrutiny to all the models across the board uh, to make sure that they deliver on the outcomes that they promise, because we all tend to overpromise. And again, I'm going to go back to the to the data behind. I just want to emphasize again: these models are highly dependent on the underlying data, right? They're data-driven models. So, 
having, you know, this is something we talk about also all the time across um, the industry, uh, being able to share data in mm -hmm. some sort of, you know, federated data learning infrastructure, some way to be able to share data, replicate models, test your model on a different data set. Again, depending on the specific context of use, this type of scientific replication is critical, right? This way you can ensure that the model that you've developed that's giving you a certain result, you can get that same result on a different data set. It's not reliant on certain types of data. Do you think, David, that that kind of sharing, that, that collective, more harmonious approach would be uh, embraced by industry, simply because I sure, wonder how much of developing it. these. I, I mean, it, it doesn't get discussed that much, but uh, you know, a little over a decade ago, we acquired a company called Decode Genetics, which is a you know subsidiary of, of Amgen now, and it's the I think premier genetics organization in the world. We have uh, I, almost undoubtedly the largest data set uh, of genomic data, hundreds of thousands of whole genomes now. Um, but also other types of what we call omic data, so proteomic data. I take a tube of blood from you and get a sample of all of the proteins that are present in your blood and, at, importantly, at what levels. Your genome is fixed. Your proteome changes. And we're now using artificial intelligence to develop proteomic signatures of disease. Again, a way to get insights into the biology uh, of that disease. You know, we've made enormous progress against cancer you know, in the last few decades. I'm trained as an oncologist, so I have a biased point of view here. But that was based on a, a much deeper molecular understanding of the disease and the, and the mutations that drive cancers. Well, we know many other diseases also fit into discrete categories on a molecular level, a, a disease like lupus. In different patients, it has very different clinical manifestations. We use a very crude checklist, you know, shamefully crude checklist, to make the diagnosis now. Now, we know there are probably three or four different diseases tucked under that clinical label on a molecular level, but we don't know what they are yet. It's only through the use of enormous data sets that I'm talking about that we're actually going to be able to understand what different types of patients and diseases exist there. And without that understanding, of course, you don't know how to develop any kind of therapeutic hypothesis or figure out what to do about the disease. So, so there, I would argue that not only is it a nice tool to have, it's actually essential. We don't have any other way to answer the question, we, you know, in, in our data set now, we have in excess of 200 petabytes of data. Petabytes? 200 petabytes of data. That's a lot, I take it. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up, you know, for all you non-scientists out there. It's like way beyond a lot. And you, so way this is not something that you download Nobody into knows. an Excel spreadsheet and play around with. Uh, in fact, you know, it takes using some of the high-speed high transmission lines two weeks to move it from one place to another. Um, it is incredibly secure. It's never connected to the Internet, and it's in, mul in multiple layers of encryption, naturally. But that data set can only be approached with machine learning and artificial intelligence for certain types of questions. Simply because it's so massive. Because that... it's so massive. So what, I'm, what the point I'm trying to make is that we are now going to be able to do things that are qualitatively different, not just faster and better, but actually different than, we, than what we did before. And now we're right at that, what I like to call the hinge moment, where that door is starting to swing open. We have an enormous amount to learn but that moment is on us. It, it's on us right now. Yeah, I think the distinction there is between tools that are probabilistic, so they increase your odds at coming up with a certain outcome, and that's especially relevant when you're trying to downsize an unmanageable size of data to something that you can deal with. And then you have tools that can couple with AI, whether it's used in you know, proteomics, metabolomics, and all that to identify targets, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, with tools that are also in silico, in silico tools that are more deterministic. So yeah. tools that will actually look at the underlying mechanism. So you start with a probabilistic tool that's data-driven, 
and that's both good and bad, and then downsize that chemical space and then examine it at a higher level with principal physics led models that yeah. get at the fundamentals of why these targets might be relevant. And that way, what you do is you move from correlation to causation. And that's, I think, to me, that's the fundamental distinction. Just because you see something present more in one sample of another doesn't necessarily imply cause. Yes. Yeah. I'm so happy you mentioned that, because I love causal AI. Um, so this is where you're applying basically, you know, your traditional epidemiologic type of thinking or biostatistical thinking to AI that is very data driven, but now you're put, putting a causal framework around it. Um, that again depends on the context of use. There are certain applications from our point of view where we want to understand why. Why did you get this specific outcome? So we might ask for the, the sponsor or the applicant to give us an explanation of how the model reached that specific conclusion, right? There are certain situations where this type of causal framework is not necessary, like you just talked about the different phases where you might mm -hmm. have to have a deterministic type of approach, um, but certain applications you definitely need to understand how did you get to this specific answer. And the, and the point that both Jacob and Tala brought up earlier, I think, is critical, which is validating right. what you produce. So whenever we develop a model, the first thing we do is go to other data sets and say, you know, can it do a couple things? Number one, can it tell us things we already know? In other words, can it replicate things where we already know the answers? Because if it can't do that, it's back to the drawing board. And then can it make predictions that we can then prove are true, uh, but you need to do that on hopefully more than one additional data set. Then you're comfortable that it's giving you the truth. The big danger here, uh, and Jacob was alluding to that, is, is that now that we're grappling with these enormous data sets, you know, anyone with a statistical package and a little bit of training can take them and come up with an enormous number of correlations. Now, what I'm always telling my teams is what I'm really interested in is which ones of those are true, meaning which ones are actually pointing us causally from a finding here to a disease here or, or a disease outcome. And that's a much tinier subset. And knowing the difference between those that are just an association and those that are actually true and, and truly ca causal is really hard. Uh, and that's sort of the, the point where the field is right now. And that's why you would need uh, multidisciplinary yeah. expertise yeah. when you're developing these models, but also when you're interpreting these models. Because exactly. if you're just using a purely data science type of approach without involving the pharmacologist or the toxicologist or the clinician, then you might get these correlations that you think make sense, but they don't actually make sense if you know the specific context. You're not just trying to justify that we have to keep humans around we for do. a few more weeks we before we are. Yeah. Surprisingly, <laughs> hang on. Sorry. I was just going to say, I, I have plenty more things I would love to ask them about. But if you all have questions that you would like to, well, I think we have some microphones here that we could um, send them around to you. But um, because I, I do think there's, uh, I would love to hear if you all have particular questions for this panel. As you can see, there are particularly sharp on this. Jacob, I'm sorry, you were saying. Oh, see, now I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> the humans. The humans. <laughs> well, from Mike, so we, we do a lot of work uh, on predicting toxic outcomes, and that's where there's very limited data, and we kind of steer away from, uh, from machine learning in general and use more principle-driven and physics-led approaches. Um, but um, my experience has been humans are often terrible models for other humans. Meaning you are not me, and, yeah. and Tala yeah. and David are not. Yeah, yeah. the variability, the, the intraspecies variability for a lot of endpoints is so great that we, you know. Maybe AI can fix that, too. Yeah, well. <laughs> Just smooth us all out. It'd be so much easier. Again, it's going to run into the data problem for some of yeah. these right. issues. No, I think that that is it. Uh, do we have any questions out there right now? Yes. Vice Chancellor for Health Science and Dean at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine. 
First, um, thank you for such an informative and stimulating discussion. This question is to um, David. I understand um, just this quest to utilize AI in clinical trials for the efficiency of recruitment and identifying sites that may be able to rapidly recruit um, patients. I'm also concerned that when we do that, when we think through an, an equity lens or diversity lens, we, we may be missing out on recruiting diverse populations, therefore drugs that are coming to the market are not sufficiently tested in diverse population. Would you? Yeah, no, I, it's an incredibly important topic. It, it's one I, I formed within our research and development organization several years ago, actually a team devoted to enhancing diversity in our clinical trials. Uh, because as you're pointing out, the key thing is that drugs should be studied in pop, the relevant populations uh, where diseases are prevalent. Uh, and as a field uh, in general, industry, government, academia, we need to do much better in that domain. I would actually turn around what, what, what you're saying uh, be, and, and say this is a real opportunity to actually enhance diversity in our trials. And in fact, we're trying to use our, our algorithms to help us identify non-traditional areas uh, to enhance recruitment. You know, these models are built now off of hundreds, soon thousands uh, of factors, uh, including things like the, the microepidemiology of disease uh, in certain communities. Uh, and that can then point you to how can we actually get access to these patients to clinical trials who may not routinely uh, have that? So what Jacob said earlier is the critical piece here, how you're developing these models and using them depends critically on the data that are used uh, to train them. And so that's something we're giving a lot of thought to right now. Were there more? Yes. I'm curious as it pertains to the use of AI in uh, development of biomarkers. Uh, I'd like to hear if that's feasible uh, and with a couple things in mind, particularly as we look at uh, clinical trials uh, that are going to take a very, very long time uh, in order to generate uh, data right now anyway based on traditional tools that will allow a, a company to justify moving forward with it allow the FDA comfort in approving it, and, and, and therefore the, the uh, clinical trials aren't undertaken when with a, the appropriate or true biomarkers, there might be comfort in moving forward faster. So I'm curious, uh, maybe particularly for David, uh, do you envision AI as a, a means of developing these biomarkers? And then for Dr. Fakori, uh, do you envision the ability to approve drugs based on such data? as opposed to true outcome, patient outcome data. Thank you. Can you just also mention, tell us what biomarkers are for yeah, those who don't say, know? Yeah, so, so biomarker is, is basically anything you measure. You know, you know, it, it could be your hair color for that matter, uh, but blood pressure that then correlates or, or is followed uh, and uh, for, out, for an outcome. Uh, you know, here we're often talking about um, you know, a mutation, a, a level, uh, your LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, the level of that is a biomarker. So what I was saying earlier about developing, for example, proteomic signatures, that's actually a biomarker. Uh, if that signature tells us now we have a more homogeneous population of patients where we believe the, disease, uh, the, the drug has the greatest likelihood of effect, that then streamlines how we study it, when we talk to the FDA, how do we design that trial, and ultimately what the drug label will actually say for you know, who's appropriate to receive and not receive the drug. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to, to hear Tala comment here in a moment because we're coming to a new era where the biomarker may not be something as simple as your cholesterol level, but a much more complicated signature, for example, how are we going to grapple with that on a development level and on a regulatory level? 
Yeah, some of the submissions that we've received that I mentioned we described in that landscape analysis last year include biomarkers, include endpoints and, and outcomes where AI was used or machine learning was a component. Um, there's also digital uh, biomarkers as part of you know, digital health technologies that are out there. Um, for us, clinical validation is critical, obviously, for, for these types of biomarkers, so providing that evidence would be very helpful. Again, going back to our evidentiary standards are the same. Regardless of the technology you use, there are certain things that need to be done so that we're comfortable that that biomarker truly reflects an underlying um, condition or un underlying um, uh, outcome that you're, you're interested in studying. Yes. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, listening to you all talk about this very important subject. Uh, my name is Rick Burrs. I'm an uh, adjunct faculty in the uh, Global Health Department here at the School of Public Health at GW. Um, I've done mathematical modeling before, and um, what, we do, what we usually do uh, at, at the end of our work is to uh, is a sensitivity analysis to evaluate the integrity of the model uh, that we've been uh, putting together. And, and so I'm wondering, uh, do you do that for uh, AI? Uh, and could you elaborate a little bit on that so that um, I, I'm sure you, the FDA, for instance, would critically evaluate any model, uh, and as well, of, of course, as the data that goes into building that model. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know how you evaluate the integrity of the model that you put together so that, so that the result is not misinformation or information that comes out that is not critically accurate. Who wants Mr. to take that? Hmm. I could, but As I'm it, not. I'm Go happy ahead. To, <laughs> I'm happy to comment from our side, but you're the practitioner, so if you want to provide. Well, I would say that the, the principles, the, the proof is in the pudding. So external validation of a model, I think, is always the most deterministic. So you take a model and you apply it to, to your chemical, biochemical space, and you see over time how well it performs. And you can measure that in terms of accuracy of prediction, sensitivity, specificity, so your the kind of false negative, false positive predictions. Those are all pretty standardized metrics. So I, I don't see how AI-based models diverge in any way from, uh, from other predictive models in terms of external validation uh, procedures. That's right. And uh, you know, our, um, when we receive submissions, our review divisions work very closely with the sponsors to answer and ask questions, right? Um, our biostatisticians also can sometimes themselves analyze, reanalyze the data, look at it in different ways. None of these things change. Um, in terms of, for some models, it might be obviously difficult to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. But this is where you have that conversation with the sponsor. You could ask for additional simulations. You could ask um, for how the model performs in different situations. Uh, this has not changed. That, that process that we have, that our review divisions have with the, with the sponsors, has not changed. So for example, when you know, we would go with a model to FDA, it's been my observation that FDA would say, well, we have, or EPA for that matter, we have our own data, we'll use your model on that data to kind of get a sense of confidence of how well it performs. So there is always some external validation that takes place. Yes. Uh, thank you all. Just belt it out. <laughs> Thank you all very much for speaking today. It's been great to hear from you. Uh, my name is Albert Hinman. I'm a fellow on the House Committee for Science-Based Technology. I had a question related to workforce development, especially towards the field of drug development. I imagine that there's some areas where you need an expert, not just in AI, but the process underneath. You know, mastery of the data sets, mastery of the craft underneath. When it comes to each of the areas you're in, how do you think of onboarding the massive demand for talent and what programming, what sort of ways do you think is going to be best to meet the workforce demand that's rapidly, rapidly evolving? Yeah, that is a great question and it is very top of mind for us. There, there is, there, there, to me, there, there's no question that the, 
your research and development teams that I have in five and 10 years will be different in terms of the skill sets that they require. And so, uh, in fact, we think this is so important, we put together a group specifically to look at workforce evolution uh, and what is that talent that you need over time. It's not overnight, but it's faster than, make, than makes you comfortable that these changes will come. Uh, and so I think you know, this is a very, I, th I think, broad societal question. How do we yeah. prepare uh, workforces for this change? There, there's going to be you know, an enormous disruption and enormous opportunity. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I can tell you it's top of mind for us. I, and the FDA must be thinking it's about a, this. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, it's across the board, across all industries. We're all um, you know, tackling with the same issues. For us, one thing that we rely on is this uh, mutual learning, especially from academia. Uh, we have many mechanisms to collaborate with folks in academia where they tend to have a lot of these um, expertise. We have the CIRCES, the Centers for Excellence in Regulatory Science, where we fund a lot of work that is cutting edge, very new. Um, so we try to stay up to date by using these different mechanisms that are available to us, but I think across the board, this need to hire new expertise into our different organizations um, is an issue that we all need to, to address. Yeah. I love this question because this, and academia currently is, is not in a position it can answer it very well or meet that challenge, I would say. So I'm gonna be critical here because, as, and we kind of alluded to this at, throughout the conversation, the AI-related problems in cases like drug discovery are very multidisciplinary. And we don't train interdisciplinarity. We have a reductionist approach in sciences, which has worked well for centuries. You take complex phenomena, you break it down into building blocks. But in doing this, you lose connections between those blocks. And we have to actively work to bring those back. So that's one issue, and the other issue is very few of us in academia look at our grad students and say, what is the training that you need in a workforce 10 years from now when you have finished your PhD and you're two, three postdocs and you're joining a workforce? No, most of us just do the same thing over and over and we look at our own training as the guidance, which is often for cases like AI, oh my goodness, when you have few months of an evolution makes world of a difference, right? So, Case, the last thing I will say is an example in drug discovery, you know, it may be less relevant to train PhD students in process chemistry in drug discovery in this country, where those jobs may not be available for small molecules 10 years down the road, but bringing data science, bringing AI, bringing quantum mechanics may be the future. So looking ahead and incorporating that into training in academia I think is critical, and we are not doing it enough. I, I'm sorry to cut you off. We have to wrap up at this point. Um, I cannot thank you all for participating in this and cannot thank the three of you so much for uh, really a fascinating conversation about obviously a truly unique frontier as you're all describing. Um, please uh, join me in thanking all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, William, Tala, Jacob, and Dave. That was a fascinating conversation, and I think we all got a much better handle on how AI uh, has become and will continue to become important to the discovery and development pipeline. So next up is a fireside chat between Mary Woolley, President and CEO of Research America, and Dr. Larry Tabak, Acting Director for the National Institutes of health. Well, welcome, Larry. Thank you. Um, 
This is going to be a tough act to follow. That was a great session. It, was, it really, it, was. it really was. I'm delighted to hear what they had to say. I'm not afraid of the future anymore. There you go. There it there is. Um, we're, we've got some things to talk about. First, let me say that today, because it's the 20th of the month, mm. marks um, 21 months. Mm -hmm that you have been the acting director of NIH with some other titles in there yeah. periodically that yeah. were very hard to remember <laughs> and focus on. Um, I think you've been great. <laughs> I think you have been great. But tell us, and I know you're um, not one to brag, but tell us what you're most proud of in these months. Well, that, that's a loaded question, right? Um, no. So, I'm most proud of my team because that's how NIH has continued to move forward. That's how NIH has continued to, you know, serve the needs of the country because of the amazing group of people, you know, that we have working there. Um, you know, there are many programmatic things that I can point to. Um, I, I have to say the previous session, um, you know, really almost demands that I, that I say something about our computational biology mm -hmm. uh, and data science programs. Um, one of the speakers spoke about 200 petabytes of data in their uh, cloud. So we have a similar amount, over 200 petabytes of data in, in a public cloud mm -hmm. where people, once they have access privileges and so forth, can compute across multi-omics, images, um, electronic health record type uh, data, and so forth. Um, again, we, we've made significant investments in AI as it intersects with biomedical science. But we've, we've really paid a great deal of attention, and this is something I'm very proud of, to the need to reach out to the heretofore marginalized and underserved communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm not only related to including individuals from these populations within the data sets, which is crucially important, because unless you train the, the algorithms uh, appropriately, you, you know, you'll get uh, erroneous, uh, you know, results. But, but in addition, to, to allow them the training opportunities to take on uh, AI in, in, as a discipline, um, so we have a program called Aim Ahead, which is reaching out to uh, historically minority-serving institutions and has engaged them. And we have a sort of parallel effort within um, the American Indian Alaska Native community. Um, what's so beautiful about this is you, you don't need that fancy mass, mass spectrometer or NMR and all the other heavy equipment that you'll find walking around this campus. You need a computer terminal, and so it really yeah. lends itself. But there are many other things that we're doing, uh, you know, th that I'm very proud of. Our outreach to the underserved and marginalized communities. Among the many lessons that we learned during the pandemic was that you had to proceed, and this is, I'm paraphrasing Gary Gibbons and Eliseo Peristable, you have to proceed at the speed of trust. Yes. yes. And, and while algorithms may help you uh, identify populations and subpopulations, I'm sure everybody appreciates what you also have to do is you have to meet people within their communities to establish credibility, to establish dialogue, to establish relationship. And NIH is spending quite a bit of time on this. And, and, that, and so those are among the things that I'm extremely proud of. That, that's great. And it's been noticed. Uh, we heard about it, actually. Rob Califf gave you a great shout out great. yesterday at our forum for yeah. exactly this reason. Right. We're going to get to trust, but I want to stick with the pandemic for sure. a minute. Sure. Um, there's been a lot of talk about lessons learned, but you're working on, and IH is working on, long COVID right. right now, too. Can you tell us a little bit about the Recover Initiative? Yeah, so the Recover Initiative began in 2021. Uh, we we're very fortunate to get resources from the Congress dedicated to this. Um, post sequelae of viral infections, have been, we've known about those for forever. But in this instance, we, we have one slight advantage in that we are absolutely sure of the etiologic agent, SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The bad news is, is that SARS-CoV-2 that was 
at the beginning of the pandemic is very different than what it is today. And so it's sort of a moving target. It's a multi-system disease uh, targeting almost every organ system of, of the body. And, and, and so as a result, we had to build uh, rather sophisticated cohorts uh, to get our arms around this, to, to begin to really understand what the biological underpinnings are. We have recently launched uh, some interventional trials, one related to viral persistence, mm -hmm. uh, the idea being that there are reservoirs of virus which uh, continue to um, dust up, if you will, the immune system. Uh, we've also uh, begun one on um, uh, cognitive disorders, which is another important uh, uh, um, challenge that, 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 that some of these uh, patients are, are, are experiencing uh, with uh, three different interventions. And all of these trials are nested uh, into one another, and each will inform the other because we don't only take measures of the specific system that we think is uh, you know, being targeted, but we are looking at a whole approach so that we can glean as much information as possible. Three more trials will be launched over the next uh, number of months uh, to look at things like um, uh, autonomic dysfunction, uh, sleep disturbance, and then finally uh, the uh, fatigue and exercise intolerance. Mm -hmm. All of these are the things that people most uh, comment about uh, as, as their most significant challenges. That's a, a big agenda. It is. Um, but I know you're up to it. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think, too, about what it is that NIH is all about, mm -hmm. the NIH mission. Um, and we know you've issued an RFI now, mm -hmm. um, wanting information from everybody here and, and way beyond here um, mm -hmm. about updating mission, which I find really interesting as to why that's come about. That's mm -hmm. one question. But I mm -hmm. want to read you, or for us all, what the current mission statement mm -hmm. is. It is uh, the mission of the NIH is to, quote, seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability, unquote. So how did it come about to change this, and what do you expect to hear? Right. So just to, to level set, yeah. Um, the first part of the mission statement says we have to do fundamental research. Mm -hmm. But the second part of the statement says, but then we have to take what we learn and apply it to tangibles to help our patients. But the final part related to disability is where um, we have um, ha received feedback. Um, and, and it's for that reason that we are seeking guidance from the population as a whole. Um, we take DEIA very, very seriously. We've been working very hard at creating a more inclusive and diverse uh, environment, uh, not only within NIH, but amongst our grantee organizations. And as I'm sure many of you know, there are some individuals who are uh, disabled who, who don't want to be um, addressed in, in, in a way that um, sounds like they need to be repaired, um, they're quite um, satisfied with their lives as they are, um, and, and, and they really uh, prefer, uh, you know, that we not uh, sort of look through an ableist lens, mm -hmm. as, as they would mm -hmm. call it. So what the RFI asks is, how would, how would you navigate this in a way that is respectful um, to, to as, as many, many different individuals um, as, as, as is possible. So I'm going to read it because I haven't memorized it yet. Okay. But, but one, of the, one, of the, one, of, one example, um, the proposed, and it, again, it's proposal. That's why we're asking for input. To seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems, still there, and to apply that knowledge to optimize health and prevent or reduce illness for all people. And so we are silent about mm -hmm. dis disability. Mm -hmm. It will be very interesting and instructive uh, to learn what people think about this. Because again, the idea is, is we want to include and make welcome 
all of the population, and, and in no way do we wish to um, you know, insult uh, you know, individuals who, who have very strong feelings about this. And, uh, and so we're looking forward to the feedback, and based on that, that will of course inform what, what we do next. Makes sense. So yeah. just to clarify, if um, people wanted to comment on other parts of oh. the mission statement, is that welcome Absolutely. also? Absolutely. Of course. Okay. Yes. Okay. No, of course. When you, when you put, as you know, as you put out a request for information, <laughs> uh, you get information back. And, that, and that's great. And that's great. Because we always learn something. Yep. You know, we always learn something. And in this case, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's going to be very helpful as the organization plans for the future. Yeah, I agree with you, and I'm a, a personally a, just a really big fan of revisiting mission mm -hmm. statements on a regular basis. Just make sure you got your fingers on the pulse. Indeed. Right? Um, speaking of which, let's turn to trust. Mm. And I think keeping a finger on the pulse of what non-scientists think about science is a major issue for everybody. And we've been hearing more and more about that. Right. You and I have talked about Indeed. it a bit. Yeah. Um, we note that there's a new initiative now, as, as of last month in August, from PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, to, um, aimed to you and other federal science agencies, um, asking you to put a higher priority on public engagement. So I do want to know what you have in mind about that. I also want to add, though, that in a um, national survey that Research America commissioned earlier this year, we learned from that 80% of respondents, 80% of the adult American population, um, said that scientists should consider it part of their job to inform the public about their research and its impact on society. Now, I know that um, current knowledge in communication is not to do that in a, in a deficit model, like I'm really smart and I'm gonna tell you what it's all about, but rather to engage. Right. Um, and I think that's consistent with what PCAS has talked about. Um, but tell us what NIH has in the works in this regard and where you think it's all headed. Well, so first, you know, we're, we're very grateful to the White House for really shining a spotlight on this. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously incredibly important. It's incumbent upon every scientist, particularly those that are funded by federal you know, resources, um, to take it upon themselves uh, to, to reach out uh, to the general community, to the, to the lay population. Um, that's non-trivial. If any of you have tried to talk about multi-omics to the Rotary Club, it, it, it's a challenge, okay? Um, AI, you know, to uh, the PTA, it, it's, it's, you know, difficult to do. So, you know, we, we've been exploring uh, ways of uh, in, in perhaps incorporating into uh, training approaches um, this additional facet of, of, of one's education. Right. Um, in the last panel, there was a discussion about how do you train people for the next you know, 10 years of, of, of their career? Right question, okay? Mm -hmm. This is part of what that needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as, 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 as leaders of the scientific community, we have to model this behavior ourselves. Um, and so whenever the opportunity comes up to speak, not necessarily at a scientific meeting, but one where uh, there, there are likely to be more um, of, a, of a lay uh, audience, uh, you know, I typically say yes. Um, do, particularly know. if uh, there's an opportunity to speak to young people to encourage them to, uh, you know, look at STEM education. Uh -huh. um, and, um, and, and so these are the kinds of things we have to do. Now, there's a whole science of communication, as you well know. We do support uh, quite a bit of work in this area already. Um, and going forward, I presume that now that the White House has issued this sort of call, if you will, to, to, to take, take a look at this you know, more seriously, that the research community will begin to adapt and perhaps focus more of their uh, efforts um, in this space. It's certainly something that would be welcome. 
Well, we're certainly working on that, as you know, and I encourage everybody who's interested in it to get in touch with us, as well as Larry and his team. I want to just make a few comments uh, on this topic. One is that I've learned from um, people in the non-science trained community that the word lay is not one they like, mm. you know, because it does summon up that um, priest class and the lay people <laughs> and all, what, however you might want to frame it. But uh, so we, when we are talking to scientists about being effective um, with a non-science trained audience, we, that's one of those words we put an X through, just FYI. Um, I, I would also say that what you said about making it an additional piece of education, uh, making it a norm in the graduate science curriculum and maybe before that, mm -hmm. to learn about public engagement and, and communication according to what we know now, not what we were trained in ourselves or um, has been in textbooks for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, so I, but this is a conversation with you, it's not my podium. Well, um, and you know, and, and I'm also reminded about the last time we discussed this yes. publicly. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about was the need for scientists to also become more facile with, with policy issues. Yes. Um, I, I'm reminded because I see Kerry Wollinitz out there and it, it, you know, it's hard not to think of policy when, you know. But, um, and, and so, it, but that's, that's another piece of this because it does better prepare yes. scientists to speak to the non-scientist community. See, I'm <laughs> educable. At that. I'm educable. <laughs> Look yeah. at that. Well, completely agree with you. It's, it's um, uh, if we can get more of an awareness of science serving the public's interest and being aware of the public context mm -hmm. of science, which includes the political context, mm -hmm. I think we could make great strides forward in overcoming this trust deficit, right. shall we say. Um, and just to continue on trust for just a minute, um, can you think of things that will either help restore trust um, or undermine it, undermine it, undermine it further? That your crystal ball has to offer here. Well, again, we we, we have a lot of repair to do. Mm. Um, you know this. Yes. Um, I I think. Part of it is our um, ineffective um, explanation of, the, of how science actually works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The fact that science is, is, is not a, a series of truths that are written in, in, in tombs, you know, but rather um, that it is ever evolving. Yes. And so, you know, on the first day, you may say it's X. On the third day, it may become Y. That, that's not, you know, deliberate obfuscation. That's the science has evolved and, you, you know, you've learned something new. We need to do a better job of explaining that. Um, and, and I think we have to do this early and often and engage, um, you know, as partners, uh, those in the non-scientific community, other stakeholders, um, you know, members of Congress, their staff, um, other parts of the government. I mean, we, we all just have to do a better job of, of, of trying to explain how much of science is ever evolving. Right, right. And, and, um, and, and then, you know, if, if I mean, somebody was talking about, uh, you know, doing some sort of mathematical test for the precision of your result, you know, we have to sort of put boundaries about what we're saying, you know, and, you know how much uncertainty there is or there isn't, because Obviously, as things evolve, um, you know, there is some uncertainty, and I think we have to, you know, acknowledge that. Own that, yeah. yeah. I, I think I hear in what you're saying also that um, let's not be afraid of skepticism mm -hmm. as uh, voiced by non-scientists, because yeah. after all, it's a value in science. That's exactly right? right. So I think it's a way to connect to people who don't have science training. So you sound like a scientist. Right. I was trained that way. That's right. um, let's talk. You know? um, well, now I want to ask you how you can help all of us who you must consider as your friends and advocates mm -hmm. as you make, you and your colleagues, make the case for the NIH budget and policies. But let's especially talk about the budget right mm -hmm. now. 
Um, we're lo it's looking like a shutdown. Um, you might want to opine on that for a few minutes, and then, um, uh, and then, and then talk about how we can help you. Well, obviously, um, we have no control over what the you know Congress ultimately decides to do. Um, but you know, the effect of a shutdown, however short, and indeed uh, the effect of of budget numbers that we've seen, and again, without any knowledge of what the final you know, budget will be, right. um, do raise great cause for concern. Um, the, the, the biomedical research community is a living thing. And young people are not stupid. They're a whole lot smarter than, than I am, for sure. And when they see um, vagaries in, in future support yeah. for, for what they have fallen in love with, mm -hmm. and if they see the, 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 the fear and concern of their um, faculty um, as, as they sort of try and read the tea leaves, um, it, it does have an overall chilling effect for the future, which you then feel for several years. It's, it's not a one-time thing. And additionally, in times of budgetary stress, and we've, you know, we've seen this before, obviously, over the years, sadly, it's the new investigator, it's the investigator from you know, historically marginalized communities, it's women who, who tend to be more uh, adversely affected. Now, we're aware of that. You know, we'll take whatever steps we can to help ameliorate that. But what we surely do not want to do is to, you, to lose a generation of scientists, both because of you know, budgetary stress and funding decisions, plus you know, back further in, in the pathway of, of career development, somebody thinking, you know, I'm, I don't think this is a good idea. I, I'm yeah. going to you know, do something else with my life. Mm -hmm. Because we need all the talent we possibly can attract to biomedical research. And we need it from all parts of our nation. We need it from people with all different types of experiences and backgrounds. Because every study we are aware of shows that if you've got diverse team, diverse thought, you do a better job. And, 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 and those individuals who may have been marginalized all along, they're going to be the first ones to say, nope, with all due respect to attorneys, I'm going to law school <laughs> because, because it's a sure thing. And, and so those, those are the sorts of things that I really, really worry about. And I do hope that our leaders in Congress you know, are able to navigate this through. So as you you know, engage with, with, with your individual members. Um, you will advocate for whatever it is that you think you should advocate for. I don't <laughs> tell people what to say or do, but, but, but whatever your views are, make them heard. You know, whatever your views are, speak up, because they are more likely to listen to you as an individual constituent or as a patient advocate or as a you know, community advocate, then they will listen to me. That's understandable. Um, so whatever your views are, don't be bashful. Thank you for saying that. And you know we agree. Um, we also, um, I hope you know, realize that, uh, well, real, we don't just realize. We know that you do, in fact, have influence on the Congress. You're well respected. And there's a reason for that, Larry. It's all your hard work, your credibility, your commitment. It's shown over the years, and never more so brightly than the last 21 months. I know there is likely to be a little more. <laughs> I hope only you, a little bit more. We want you to keep the faith, you know. Um, and we want to know that we celebrate you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So.
I'm going to duck over I'm here. I'm going to follow you. Yeah. But then you get to speak some more because I'm going to step up to this All podium. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Now we're going to move to um, some lessons, some discussion of lessons learned during the pandemic. And we've all learned some lessons. I know that, um, and we are still dealing with COVID in a very big way. I know some of our colleagues at Research America are um, dealing with it as we speak. And um, as it happens, one of the panelists at the upcoming, at this next um, discussion also just informed us like a few minutes ago that um, he's uh, suddenly dealing with COVID, so will not be joining us. We nonetheless know that we're gonna have a great session. And the reason for that is that is the people who will be speaking and all of you who will participate. So joining us now to talk about Pandemic Plus Three, Speed, Progress, and Lessons Learned, um, is Dr. Dylan George, the Director for Operations for the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Ana Analytics, C CFA, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the panel moderator, the discussion moderator, is Research America's own Vice Chair, Dr. Georges Benjamin, the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. So gentlemen, please uh, join me. Thanks so much, and over to you, Georges. Well, great, Dylan. Um, I'm really glad you're here. You know, this session is gonna talk a little bit about um, the pandemic, where we think we're gonna go with, with forecasting, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I, I remember, um, of course, I was a biology major, and um, you, you, you know, I'm a little older than you are, but shortly after the world was formed um, and I went to school. Um, you know, we used to uh, do some fascinating stuff in labs and of course we would um, do something, some of you may not know this, is this, you used to have these little round cylinders called petri dishes and you would take a little of an of a organism and you squirt it on there and you put it in an incubator and it grow it up and in a very robust time period, like several days, um, you would get to know what the organism was. Um, and then, of course, the next phase was to put it on another Petri dish so you could look at the chemical characteristics. And over time, um, you know, you got really smart and you figured out what the organism was. And then we were tracking patients. Um, you know, you do that. And, you know, sometime after the patient was discharged, you actually knew what they actually had. <laughs> um, things have moved along a little bit. And... Um, the work that you're doing now is um, very much um, quite different than <laughs> the days when, um, when I was uh, um, in those biology labs. Can you first just maybe just tell folks about what the center does and kind of give kind of level set and give the folks a sense of that? Yeah, no, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so the, the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics is one of the newest centers at uh, the United States CDC. Um, our remit is, um, and our byline is better data for better analytics for a better response. We are an operational organization within CDC to generate evidence base for decision making during health emergencies. And that's what we're trying to do um, in trying to um, improve our capabilities on um, generating that evidence base, but using predictive analytics or advanced analytics to actually generate that evidence base going forward. Yeah, yeah that's great. Because, you know, the, the truth is we, we did a lot of forecasting. Um, we got better over time during the pandemic. Um, so tell me um, how has the availability and quality of data changed over the last, um, say, three years? Um, and to the extent that that's impacted the forecasting and managing, you know, COVID-19, um, 
you know, and, and, and also didn't tell us what some of the improvements that are still needed. Yeah, I mean, COVID definitely cast a seething hot spotlight on the need for data such that we could understand what the risk was and how to mitigate that risk in going forward. Early stages of the pandemic, it was, the, it, was a, it was a scramble for understanding what was going on. And as is true in many outbreaks, there's, there's, a, there's a paucity of data, um, in, quantity and quality of data to know what it is, how is it transmitting, what is the clinical severity, um, and so that we can assess what the risk of a particular outbreak is. And that was no different from pan the, the pandemic. It was, it was clearly there was challenges in getting that information out to the public. I mean, organizations like the COVID Tracking Project, Johns Hopkins University, stepped into the breach and thank goodness that we have organizations that were able to do that. I think that's one of the things that makes America great is that people see a problem, they stand up, they kind of fill the gap and they, they, they surge to, to help out in times like that. But you know, it's like we need to find ways of actually making um, uh, data flow much more quickly, much more effectively, especially during an emergency um, uh, situation. And so, um, you know, we were, we were so there, there, was, there was challenges in the early part of the, the COVID and then data became much more broadly available as we were able to get um, information going, going forward. You know, I mean, one of the examples once um, that we, we had specifically with the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics was in the, when um, the Omicron variant came onto the scene, mm -hmm. this was uh, around Thanksgiving time, uh, and um, we all saw what was happening in terms of the growth advantage of that particular variant. Then the, the, the critical question became, it's like, well, how severe is it? Are, is it causing more disease? Is it putting people into hospitals more, more uh, broadly? We saw data from um, the Israelis, we saw data from South, um, South Africans that were coming out in this uh, uh, situation and from our, our colleagues in the UK Health Security Agency in the UK. Um, what we were able to do is actually work with um, payer provider systems like Kaiser Permanente to actually follow different cohorts that were infected with Delta and that were infected with Omicron to compare the severity of those going forward. And one of the things that I was particularly proud of, I mean, uh, my colleague Mark Lipsitz, who's a professor at Harvard, he was the one that spearheaded all of this going forward. And we were able to bring data from the United States to bear on that particular question in uh, much more quickly than what would have happened if we weren't around. And so that was an, a good example of how we were trying to move data much more quickly uh, to answer a very critical question about an ongoing outbreak going forward. But it was uh, just an early stage example of what we were trying to do and trying to accomplish. Yeah. Well, you know, at least once a week, I pick up a newspaper um, and I see a headline which um, projects the, um, the new variant of the moment. Um, and of course, because this is what we do in the media today, uh, it projects um, some degree of uncertainty about whether or not it is more infectious um, or more lethal. Um, and um, clearly, you know, the, the work that you folks are doing are helping ask that question. Um, you know, for our audience today, I mean, how, how, should we, um, how should we understand those kinds of reporting? Because quite often, you know, the reporting of the media is very, very superficial. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's um, uh, recently, one of the things that we have done in the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics as well is we took a very kind of a little bit of a scary and humbling uh, uh, effort at anticipating, trying to help people understand what the, the, the fall season is going to look like from a respiratory illness perspective. Now, we are right now, we are, we have our uh, previous to COVID, we were dealing with RSV um, and influenza, the major respiratory diseases that put people into the hospital at, at numbers and cause strain on the healthcare system. We have to confront the, the, the situation now that we have three major pathogens now. We have COVID, RSV, and influenza that are causing that going forward. And so we put out a, 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 an outlook of what this the next season is going to look like. We have to be very, very humble about this because it's very hard to do, trying to anticipate timing of different pathogens, um, when the peak will be, the, the, the magnitude of the peak. It's very challenging to do. We haven't been very success successful at this. And so, um, but given 
expert opinion, given historical data, given models that were put together to try to anticipate some of these going forward, we were able to actually put some, a, a, our best guess forward as to we were thinking that the peak will be somewhat similar in terms of hospitalization and burden in the healthcare system will be on the order of magnitude of what we saw and experienced last year. Now, to your question about variants and how do we think about variants, it's like we saw with Delta, we saw with Omicron, th those, were, those waves of COVID were created because of a new variant. And so there's, there's justifiable concern to think about these variants and know, uh, try to understand what their impact is going to be on the population because they have caused major surges in, in COVID going forward. Um, but you know, it's, it's really hard to go from a genotype to a phenotype to an epidemiological kind of instantiation in a population. Mm -hmm. We, we, do, we don't do that very well yet. And, and whether or not we'll ever be able to do that is, is open for debate, I think. But when we saw in particular in BA286 um, that there was so many mutations and then there, the location of those mutations were potentially enabling a growth advantage and an increase in transmissibility, it was justifiable to be very concerned about that particular, pa that particular variant going forward. Was it going to launch off another surge in that capacity? And so that's why we were spending a lot of time in CDC and also within the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics to really get a good sense of, does this have a growth advantage? Is it transmitting much more broadly? Is it causing more disease? And trying to understand how it's interacting with some of the medical countermeasures like tests and um, vaccines and therapeutics in different capacity. What is that impact? Um, and um, because that, knowing if that was different for that variant, it would change our assessment of what we were thinking about for the coming season going forward. Yeah. To kind of track back to our first panel um, that we had today, um, are you folks using artificial intelligence tools at all as part of that process? Yeah, you know, artificial intelligence, um, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's, just, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, um, no, artificial intelligence is really important. I think that one of the challenges that we have, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence is very, very data hungry. It, artificial intelligence works best when you have a large bolus of data and then you can throw thousands and thousands of models at it and then you can iterate through that and go there. The challenge that we have when we have an outbreak is that especially early in an outbreak, you have very few data. Yeah. And so the, it becomes difficult to apply artificial intelligence in those settings and that's pr primarily where we're trying to improve some capabilities. Now having said that, there are things about artificial intelligence that we are very interested in and um, it's what's referred to as machine learning operations. Essentially it's like how do you actually come up with and instantiate the model, the version of the model and the code that you're using, determine how much computational power you need, identify the specific data that you're working on and then what is the result of that model going forward and then how do you actually create that workflow so you can specify each of those stages and then when you make any changes to the the computational power the type of code that you're using a version of the data or any kind of other tweaks in the parameter sets that you're using you can track that and going forward so machine learning um, folks have created this machine learning operations to actually systematize how those models are generated how they're adjusted to track them so that they can throw m thousands of models at a particular data set now we're really interested in machine learning operations so that we can actually professionalize how we're using models so that we can surge and do peer-to-peer -peer sort of um, scrutinizing of our models and then also when we know we made a change to something we get a better result we can track that and improve our performance going forward so for all the reasons that people use machine learning operations to improve artificial intelligence to get results out of it we want to use those approaches as well from um, a, a way to operationalize our system going forward yeah <clears throat> Of course, another tool that you have is that we do have some experience, um, at least when you were forecasting RSV and influenza, you had the Southern Hemisphere experience yeah. to help guide you a bit, and you had the, basically the genotypes that were looked at from, from that experience to try to guide that. Um, we don't have much of that with COVID yet. No. Um, yeah, fundamentally, we have an N of three. You know, 2001, 2002, and, uh, and, and, and 23, and to 2023. So whether it's gonna be seasonal, whether or not we're always gonna have a bump in the summer and then a bigger wave in the fall, 
don't know. You know, we have an N of three because we can barely draw a line through that right now. You know, and from from a scientific perspective. Now, from a pragmatic perspective, you know, it's like for me and my family talking to my parents who are both in their 80s. I have a seven-year-old son. Um, for pragmatically, I'm going to prepare for every fall season to be kind of ready for an increased um, uh, of RSV, influenza, and COVID until I see otherwise that we're going to be in a different sort of seasonal pattern in some way. So from a scientific perspective, we can't definitively answer that. It's an open science question. From a pragmatic perspective on how I'm going to protect my family and try to pr provide advice to friends, definitely it's like need to be prepared. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, um, obviously this uh, Research America is very interested in the research enterprise and, um, you know, where do we go? I mean, how, what are the, some of the kinds of research questions that, that you need answered? Um, if, you know, if you could had to get three high value questions answered today and our amazing group of scientists here could go in their labs and get them to you, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean this, this whole sort of thing is like if you could, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the magic wand would be, it's like, yeah, if you could tell from a genotype what, what's going to happen epidemiologically with a variant, that'd be kind of cool. You know, <laughs> it's like, whether or not you can ever do that, it's like, I don't know. But it's, um, you know, we've been trying to go from pheno or genotype to phenotype for a very, very long, ever since we've understood yeah. DNA. Um, and we're getting progressively better at understanding those sorts of things, um, and particularly on doing some really cool molecular modeling and, and um, uh, envisioning in, in, in that area, but it's like that, that's, that's a really exciting area to kind of look at going forward as well. Um, I, I do think that we do need to um, include, figure out how to include behavior into infectious disease modeling in some capacity. I think we're getting fairly good at how to actually develop transmission models that will help us track, you know, susceptible and infected and recovered individuals and how they move through a system given different parameters. But, but we don't do a very good job of including behavior. And we saw the challenges of that early in the pandemic when people were moving in different ways or deciding to um, mask or to not mask or to um, uh, move uh, around uh, in, in, in contact with the other people. So I think trying to include behavior into transmission modeling is going to be an area that is really going to be interesting. And then also it's like, you know, um, some more mundane operational sorts of things. Like how do we actually, how do we bring together systemically uh, genomic sequence data with electronic health record data so that we can actually look at what is the real kind of, um, uh, so we can track individuals that have particular variants uh, and know what those are going through the system going forward as well. That's just from an operational standpoint is really pretty hard to do within our current healthcare system. And so I think those are going to be some areas where we're going to be look at that. Of course, wastewater, trying to understand how to interpret wastewater um, okay. from an epidemiological perspective too is going to be another area that I think would be uh, really fruitful over the next while as well. Yeah. You know, well, I guess some of the other behavioral things that um, I know that the Institute for Health Metrics was using early in the pandemic um, was, you know, looking at the percent of people wearing masks, for yeah. example. Um, and of course, simply percent of people wearing masks doesn't take in consideration the type of mask yeah. or properly wearing the mask, you know, um, how many people were under the nose or over the nose and under the chin or over the chin, all those different parameters of masking, uh, or whether or not using N95 versus a multi, you know, multi-layer cloth mask. Yeah. Um, do you build any of that stuff into your model? No, I mean, it's re for all the reasons that you just pointed out, it's like, I mean, even having databases that track those are really scarce and really hard to incorporate. But it's like, I mean, conceptually, you can put those into models, whether or not you can confront them with data to actually show what's happening um, in an actual environment, that's, that's the hard part. And so thinking about how to actually incorporate those in different ways is going to be a, a challenge going forward. Yeah. You know, trying to build this whole issue of trust into predictive analytics also, you know, obviously plays a role here. We've had a real challenge. Um, you know, the whole pandemic highlighted this whole issue of public trust. Um, and we lost a lot. Yeah. You know, it's hard to gain, easy to lose. Um, and we lost a lot. Um, you know, um, how do you see predictive analytics helping us be more trusting, being able to give people better answers 
uh, over time. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be, I do think it's going to be a challenge. I mean, uh, I think it will take a bit of time for people to generate intuition on how to use this information as well. For example, if we were to look at um, a, a graph of forecasting skill for numerical weather forecasting, over the last 50 years, back, um, back in the 60s and 70s in the United States, we were really bad at it. We were not good at numerical weather forecasting. We take it for granted now because everybody has a mobile device, everybody checks it to determine what they should wear, if it's gonna, whether or not they should grab an umbrella. If it's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow, we know how to incorporate that into our behavior and how we're gonna make, do our decision making. But it took a while for us to really understand, improve the models, and then figure out how to use that information to guide our, our decisions. We are in the early stages of trying to use this information in the same sort of way that it was done for numerical weather forecasting. And so people have to have a better, first um, within public health, then within government broadly, and then in the in general public, have to generate that intuition on how to use this information in a similar way. If you said it was 80% chance of rain tomorrow and you were gonna be outside all day, you would think about it differently than if you said it was an 80% chance of rain in two weeks. You would, you would use that information very differently to make your decisions. And um, we need to have that same sort of build up, that same sort of intuition going forward. Um, and, uh, and then we need to show value too. We need to improve our capabilities because we've done some stuff that has been very useful, very good. We've done some stuff that hasn't been as useful and hasn't been as good. So we need to improve the, our um, abilities to actually um, develop useful information that can actually be um, uh, uh, accessed and, and provided. The other aspect of this too is that not only do we need to have really good models, but we need to be able to communicate those models more effectively to public health individuals, um, uh, general um, uh, people that work in governors and mayors, and then the general public as well. Um, when I, I used to, at one point, I used to work in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House in, um, in a previous administration. And Louis Uccellini, who was the head of the National Weather Service at the time, he came and was, we were thinking about how do we stand up a center like this now that we're standing up. And he told me this great story about how they were doing um, tornado forecasting, wh where a tornado could touch down. They had these beautiful models that would actually be able to tell you with a, a fair amount of precision on location and timing and when you would have a tornado come down and uh, cause you know, havoc. The challenge that they ended up having, and this is the story that Louis told me, is that you know, the messaging and the warnings that they put out, you know, for example, they would say something like, you know, we're gonna have a, a, a tornado touchdown in 20 minutes. So what people heard when they heard that warning that they put out there is I've got 20 minutes to get across town, get my kid, bring them back home so we can all get into the cellar together and be safe. And so what had ended up happening is that people were out on the streets at the time of touchdown. So the messaging was really off um, to try to get the result that they wanted. Uh, and so he, the lesson I took from Louis is that communicating the result and the, the model is as important or more important than the actual result. It doesn't matter how good the model is and the results that you get, if people don't know about it, if you don't communicate it well, and you don't uh, uh, communicate it in a timely fashion, it doesn't really matter. And so that's, that's why we're spending a lot of our time within the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics building a team that could help translate the results more effectively as well. <clears throat> interesting, interesting. Several years ago, um, um, when we were all afraid of that other bird flu <laughs> pandemic, yeah, yeah, the yeah. one that was yeah. coming but didn't get here, um, the Skoll Foundation funded a uh, crowdsourcing app called Flu Near You. Yeah. And you remember that? I, I used it. to yeah. get up every day, I get, a, I get an email, and I would ask whether or not I had, was symptomatic and whether I got my flu shot. Uh, and then I could go on a map and I could actually track all the people in my community. Yep. Um, and not, not personally, but you know, they're little dots for folks. Um, who might have flu in my community, and I just kind of watched my community turn red, you know. Um, <laughs> um, and then, of course, if everybody got vaccinated, that yeah. didn't happen. But, um, and then, of course, they pivoted during COVID to COVID near you. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a crowdsourcing app. What's the role of that kind of technology? And are you folks looking at 
integrating that into what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I think what Mark Smolinski and Larry Brilliant and all those folks did at the School Foundation and then ending pandemics with kind of like having this participatory kind of data, uh, I think was like cutting edge. It was really great. And I think it's really exciting to kind of look at those sorts of things. One of the things in the pandemic that I was super excited about in terms of new data coming online was the, the trend towards more telehealth access to clinical um, mm -hmm. settings in that way. But then also, we, um, you know, um, I'm probably a bad example because I have an, uh, an analog watch, but I noticed that you have, you know, you medical, you know, you almost a medical grade device on your wrist right there. And it's, um, there's a lot of data that come across that. And, and I watch, I yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, and, and so it's, um, I'm really excited about that kind of data that come, I think that's gonna be where the future is, that we can get really interesting information off of devices like that or our phones that are, you know, it, yeah. my phone will count all my steps, it'll count how many flights of stairs I go up, it'll do all those things while I'm not even paying attention. Um, and there's gonna be really interesting information that comes off that. We need to start thinking about how we can take advantage of that information and how we can bring that in in a much more robust way. Um, and that's, that's an area that I'm pretty excited about um, and we need to start thinking about how to actually uh, use that more effectively. Yeah. yeah, well, I know I had had the proximity app and I would get notified. The challenge was it was always four days too late. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, this is, uh, so what you're referring to is like the exposure notification sort of thing. So yeah. if, two, if two cell phones were together and one person pops positive, they can report their case and then whoever that cell phone was within a certain radius would then send out a, a, an anonymous uh, note to those, pers those people that they were in close contact with somebody. And, and I agree, in a lot of places, it didn't work very well. The one thing that I will say about that, I mean, in places like Ireland, Switzerland, and even in the state of Washington in the United States, they've got some good evidence that it actually saved lives in some ways. And, and, and okay. you know, it's like you can look at that in different ways. In other places, it wasn't as successful. The thing, though, that even if it wasn't successful in those spotted areas, the, the, the interaction with the private sector, Google and Apple came together to s establish a standard that would allow that to even happen. Now that was a huge step forward for those organizations to actually enable that to happen and to go forward. We were able to put, even think about trying to do contact tracing at the scale we were doing because private industry came in and helped us do that sort of thing. There's no other way that we would have been able to do a traditional contact tracing. It's like, that's a very labor intensive sort of endeavor. And just, we wouldn't have even able to, been able to think about it at the scale we were, they were trying to propose it. Now, could it be better? Yes, 100%. But we need to think about really interesting ways of doing that going forward. Yeah. What, what about um, um, other metrics from sodromic surveillance? Um, for those who know sodromic surveillance is the idea of looking at symptomatology, um, data from symptomatology that gets reported or literally looking at um, um, an increase in cold medication um, coming off the shelf of a grocery store and correlating that with, with um, medical visits and things like that. And the idea is if you, you look at the fact that you know, cold and flu season goes up and people start using cold and flu medications and you can then say, okay, there's at least something going on here. Then you need to go and do an, an epidemiological assessment and figure that out. Um, are you folks looking at those kinds of data points as well? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting area. I mean, the biggest challenge with those kinds of data is that they're very nonspecific. So you don't, you know, something's happening, you don't know what it is. So it could be rhinovirus, it could be an adenovirus, or it could be influenza that is causing those kinds of influenza-like illness, but it's something you need to go investigate. So it's a, it's a leading indicator, which is very interesting. Um, back in a former lifetime, I used to work in the Department of Defense as, as a civilian, and one of the things that's really great about the Department of Defense is that they, they track everything everybody does, and, um, in, and including the electronic health records and where they're located. And so one of the things that was exciting, this was back when they had ICD-9 uh, ICD codes, not ICD-10 codes. And so it was like, that tells you how long ago it was that we were trying to do this. But we put together kind of like a syndromic signal with ICD-9 codes to actually try to anticipate, um, understand where influenza was in the force, and then try to forecast it going forward. And um, we put together some really great models that will help us understand how flu was moving or, or flu-like illness yeah. was moving through the forest in the United States. And then uh, we were able to track that in different ways. And that was actually, 
uh, almost a proof of concept of what we're trying to do now in the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics. So syndromic information is really interesting. The thing that's best about it is it's a leading indicator. You see that before you see anything else. And so that's why, yeah, we are trying to incorporate that in, working with our colleagues within CDC that are working in the National Syndromic Surveillance Program and, and trying to uh, develop that further. Yeah. Just have one other question, and we can go to questions in the audience. Um, yeah, we, we, in Maryland, when I was the health officer in Maryland, um, we were doing some syndromic surveillance work with the applied physics labs at Hopkins, yeah. and we were, we were tracking influenza, and it was great that we would, we actually picked up um, influenza earlier hmm. than um, we would normally have picked it up through our, our traditional lab surveillance. And of course, when um, kids were involved, we looked at school, school absenteeism. Yeah. Of course, when the kids went home for the holidays, we, we lost those data points yep. uh, until the kids who then went home and gave their influenza to, the to their parents, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we then saw it peak again. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the kids were back back in school, and so that added that data point back. But it, it was um, it, it does work, yeah. and it, mm -hmm. again, you're right. You then need to go in and um, and then actually do a more specific assessment to, to figure out what that is. Um, let me take any questions for the audience. Um, if there are any questions. I can't see, so. Yes. What's, what's coming next and what is the role of your, uh, your center? I think about monkeypox and how quickly that came, but it seemed also to, to go, um, in terms of helping us understand the risks on the, on the horizon. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And so one of the things that we're focusing on in, within the Center for Forecasting Outbreak Analytics is uh, once there is an outbreak, what is the ongoing trajectory of that outbreak? And so that's the area that we're focusing on. There, there are other programs like at the National Science Foundation um, and until recently at the at USAID that were trying to anticipate the outbreak or anticipate the spillover event. And we do think that that's research that's worthy of doing, but it's still kind of, it's not operational on how to use that yet. Now, to your question on, um, um, you know, we, we, we've been involved in, um, so, uh, two years ago, we, we had a headcount of five people. Last year, it was about 25. Now we're at about a headcount of about 50. And so we are like a startup in government. We're building our capabilities, our, our team, our tools, and our partnerships that, to actually execute on our mission. Um, but we've been also thrown into a lot of responses. And in fact, we were thrown into the MPOX response and trying to help out with that. One of the things that was really exciting about that, though, too, is that um, because of all the work that was done on COVID, one of the things that's not fully appreciated is that the, the CDC doesn't have the authority to actually mandate reporting of particular diseases. And so it took almost six months for d the data use agreements to be established with all the states in the United States to actually get the data coming forward. Now, during MPOX, we were able to take advantage of that and it took almost six to seven, eight weeks to modify the existing data use agreement so that we could actually get information on MPOX. But once that was all established, um, we could then use some of the analytical capabilities that we were putting into place, the, the famed RT estimate, which is, you know, if you have an R of one, that means you have on average, you have one more individual that is infected with uh, the disease that you have. And so if, if it's above one, that means it's growing. If it's at one, it's holding steady. If it's below one, it means it's, it's decreasing. So we were actually able to use some analytics to help us assess the RT of MPOX at the national level and then at state level and then in some major cities going forward. And that allowed us to actually talk with those jurisdictions about what was the state of their data, what was the state of their efforts in moving things forward. And it was a really great experience because it helped us really refine where we anticipated MPOX was gonna be growing, where it was declining, and how it was holding steady. And, and to work with those jurisdictions where we thought there was a possibility that it was growing in some capacity. Um, and that was all being done while we're trying to build the organization as well. And so, um, but yeah, we've been thrown into acute pediatric hepatitis, um, Marburg, Ebola, um, the MPOX, we've been helping out with COVID, and now we're helping out with the fall respiratory situation going forward. And so there's never a dull moment uh, at, uh, at the CDC, yeah. Yes, was there another one? Over here. 
over there. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for such a good presentation. Miguel Reyn Ortiz from Boise State University. You brought a very important issue that is uh, the ability to share data and how challenging that can be to establish agreements between different organizations. And I, I think it's good that COVID provided the platform so the process could be accelerated next time around. Do you foresee that to continue to be the case? in future uh, situations, would that be possible? And also, what are your insights, insights in terms of also gathering data from clinical providers who are closer to the, the people who have the disease? Yeah, I mean, I, in, until the CDC has the, the appropriate authorities to um, receive information on an ongoing basis um, when we're not in a public health emergency, we are always going to be in the realm where we have to negotiate these data use agreements. And that's just the un unfortunate nature of where we are in our federalism system in the United States. And so we, there is some discussion about trying to define what those data authorities would be like and to, to move that forward so we wouldn't be losing six months into a pandemic to um, establish what those data are so that people can have the action and understanding of going forward. But that's, an, that's still an open discussion as to how that is going to be uh, put into place and if that's going to be put into place uh, in, in terms of data authorities. To, to your question on uh, trying to work much more closely with um, uh, clinical settings or payer provider organizations, I think you're exactly right. Those are going to be really interesting opportunities. I think one of the things that we, we look on to um, nations like the, um, the United Kingdom or the uh, Israel with a lot of envy because they have Relative, they either have one or few um, uh, clinical settings, so they can, tr and they also have ability to track individuals through those systems, so that they know what's going on with that individual, and so they can aggregate information mm -hmm. in a unique way that we can't within our federalism, uh, within our kind of like siloed uh, and fragmented healthcare system in the United States. And so we are looking at trying to work with uh, pair, major payer provider systems to try to think through. How could we work um, on with them on tracking not individuals but aggregating data uh, in a in a unique way? I mentioned the the work that we had done with Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. They are a payer provider system like that, and they were because of uh, the way that they were actually had the different assays and they could track cohorts of individuals so that we could tell the severity of co Omicron versus Delta going forward is an example of the power of doing that going forward. Um, and so just this week, uh, we did, um, we, we awarded a handful of performers to actually develop a network of performers that are gonna help us improve methodologies and improve uh, capabilities going forward. One of those was Kaiser Permanente Southern California. So we are going to explore that going forward. We're gonna try to capitalize on some of that um, and try to use that clinical data in, in, in a way that we haven't had access to before. Yeah. Let me add, just to be clear, the administrative work involved in having to, every time something happens like this, to then renegotiate with every single state it's data not, sharing agreements, full employment for lawyers, <laughs> full employment for typists, yeah. <laughs> uh, bad for the public's health. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You, as, a, as a state health officer, you know, you, you, oh, lived, absolutely. you lived it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the truth is we used, to, we used to guard that control very carefully and jealously. I mean, um, my counties didn't want to give the data to the state until they had validated it was absolutely perfect. And then we got it at the state level and then the state guarded it very jealously until we were absolutely clear about what it was. Um, and then we sent it to the CDC. By the way, the CDC doesn't get the data in most cases directly. Um, and so, you know, 12 months later, um, the data is coming out. I remember as a DC health officer here um, addressing um, infant mortality, um, you know, two years in the rear. Yeah. So we, we've got to stop being data archaeologists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like driving a car through your rearview mirror. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Dylan George from the CDC. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.
Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you for giving us all a lot to think about, right? And some things to advocate all for. Right. Um, I was fascinated by the analogies to the uh, yeah, weather very, forecasting experiences uh, and lessons learned, including great. about yeah. uh, behavior and communication. But then this point about data um, is just, it's mind boggling, really. I think that we have so much data, but we can't put it to work the way that, that would be most um, impactful for saving lives. You know, that is a call for advocacy to find ways forward in our federalist system, as was described. Um, so now we're going to move on to a topic that is, I think, is really it's heartbreaking, and it's about maternal mortality. Um, and we all know about this. It's been covered uh, pretty extensively in the media. Um, but the news doesn't seem to be getting a lot better, which is really disturbing. Uh, we're losing way too many lives, including um, many more, especially black and brown lives, uh, people who um, are dying in childbirth or, or after, shortly thereafter. So to talk to us on this topic, um, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Diana Bianchi, the director for the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the NIH, and joining her in conversation with Research America board member, Dr. Deborah, Deborah Deese, the dean of the School of Medicine and vice chancellor for health sciences at the University of California, Riverside. Over to you, Deborah. Hi, Diana. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And Dr. Bianchi, welcome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And as I was thinking about it, there's just so much that we could really um, talk about, given that child health and development, as well as physical and mental health, is a passion for both of us. Yeah. We know that um, maternal mortality is a critical issue in the United States. Um, as the audience might already know, the World Health Association, um, or the World Health Organization defines maternal mortality as the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of delivery. And when we think about the US as a developed country, we have the highest maternal mortality rate. It's expected that about 700 women in the US will die each year from conditions related to um, pregnancy or childbirth. This issue is an issue that needs to be addressed, and no doubt, it can't be addressed unless we do it in a cross-disciplinary way. So tell us um, more about the IMPROVE initiative and how this will help reduce maternal mortality. Certainly, it's my pleasure to do so. And thank you to Research America for inviting me as a representative of the IMPROVE initiative. Um, actually, the number is worse than 700. It's now up to 1,200. And it continues to go up in contrast to other equally developed nations. So I know we've been discussing other crises, the COVID pandemic, uh, the opioid crisis, but we really do have a maternal health crisis in our country as well. And to address this, the NIH has created the IMPROVE initiative with the support of Congress. So there was a specific appropriation of $30 million to address this initiative. So IMPROVE is an acronym for implementing a maternal health and pregnancy outcome vision for everyone. And the everyone part is very important because there are racial and ethnic disparities. So if you're a black or African-American woman, and I will use women and persons interchangeably to be inclusive, 
But if you're black or African American, your chance of dying during pregnancy or in the year after pregnancy is 2.6 times that of a white woman. And if you're an American Indian or an Alaska Native, you also have increased chances of maternal mortality. And even populations like Hispanic populations, which typically have been lower, everybody's going up. So we really do have a crisis on our hands. And so what is the IMPROVE initiative? That's what you asked. Well, it's a six-part initiative that is really focused on coordinating basic translational and clinical research with an emphasis on the community and implementation. So Congress is always asking us, you know, what are you going to do about those numbers? How do you bring down those numbers? And that's why implementation and being aware of the specific needs of the community are so important. What women on a Navajo reservation in Arizona need is very different from women who are in um, downtown Brooklyn, for example. And we've learned that. And so there's been a very intentional effort to spread all of our initiatives around the country and serving multiple different populations. So the, the core of the IMPROVE initiative are the centers of excellence. There are 10 of them. And they will be charged with uh, really addressing, uh, re reducing the mortality rates in their communities by implementing new science that have been created by other parts of the initiative. So we have these six parts. They involve looking at the electronic health records to get real world data. We've got two community initiatives. One is focused on helping communities become competitive to get grant funding for needs in their own community. They're also geared at developing trusted relationships with leaders in individual communities. We've got a maternal health tech challenge, which I can talk about a little bit uh, later with regard to how that helps us in areas where there aren't enough maternity care providers. And uh, the centers of excellence, as I mentioned, so I think I may have I think there are six there. I may have left out one, but. And you mentioned the disparities, and we know, as you've stated, that women of color are more impacted. Are there special initiatives that, that's coming out from NICHD that's using an equity lens in terms of addressing this issue? Yes, so first of all, the IMPROVE initiative is not just NICHD. Okay. So NICHD is the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Um, we actually are the lead funder of maternal health research, and we do have specific projects that are looking through an equity lens, but a large part of the IMPROVE initiative is trying to improve equity and uh, equalize care across the spectrum, and we are co-led in the IMPROVE initiative by the Office of Research on Women's Health, as well as the National Institute of Nursing Research. And many of, the, particularly the community projects, are looking at, for example, how can you use doulas to develop relationships over the pregnancy and have that trusted relationship so the doula can go into the home after the delivery and assess the post-delivery person. And that's that cross-disciplinary approach that I mentioned earlier. Yes, Short exactly. of that, yeah. we only make a dent into the problem. Correct. Yes, and when we um, look at the disparities, there is a body of research which reveals that even when controlling for insurance status, income, age, severity of conditions, people of color are less likely to receive routine medical procedures and experience lower quality care. What are some suggested targeted approaches for assessing and maybe training providers in the delivery of equitable care? Yes, so the CDC actually has a wonderful campaign called Hear Her 
because data show that women, and particularly women of color, do not get respected during their care interactions. So this is some of the, again, community-based initiatives as well as the centers of excellence will be looking specifically at this and looking at interventions to both train the workforce and um, to evaluate care before and after those interventions. Yes, so I'm really pleased to hear that because recently I read a few reports that instances such as um, physicians or clinicians yelling and shouting right. at um, some of the women while they're getting their care. So this is so, it's just really so it's, critical. Yes, and you, you just can't imagine that this is happening in our country, but it's well documented. I want to um, shift to um, postpartum care. And there are many reports that suggest that postpartum care is essential to lowering the maternal mortality rate. At the same time, about 40% of women do not receive postpartum care. And it also suggests um, that there may be issues with access as to this comprehensive postpartum care. What do you see as some of the challenges to receiving the postpartum care, and what are some strategies that are being employed to address this issue? Okay, that's a great question. So you had mentioned that the WHO considers up to 42 days postpartum, but the CDC is actually tracking data for a year postpartum. And I think most people, if you're not working in this area, would be surprised to know that the majority of maternal deaths occur in post-delivery, in the year postpartum. So between day one and day 365 after delivery. So that is an, that's a very important area that is not, hasn't been appreciated as much in the past as it needs to be. And that's again where care providers in the home or uh, you know, making sure that a person's primary care provider is aware of the fact that she recently gave birth is so important. Now, over half of the deaths are occurring postpartum, so we need ways to monitor postpartum people. And, and how do we do that, especially in low maternity care areas? So one of the aspects of the IMPROVE initiative is this RADx Tech for maternal health. So RADx Tech, some of you may be familiar with because it was the rapid acceleration of diagnostics that was created to develop COVID testing, and so it's like a shark tank funnel, we have applied that same approach to maternal health, and we have an ongoing challenge right now to uh, companies that are charged with developing technology that could be used postpartum to identify women at risk. So women at risk for hemorrhage, women at risk for high blood pressure, women at risk for mental health issues, women at risk for infection. And this is particularly acute in these so-called maternity care deserts where there is a lack of access. 2.2 million pregnant people in this country do not have access to a specialized obstetrician. Um, so what do we do? And, and it's unfortunately changing in light of other political current events that uh, providers are moving out of states where there perhaps are more restrictions on their ability to care. So we think that the deserts are going to get worse, which makes the need for this, the technology even more. So the Maternal Health Tech Challenge, we now have 10 finalists and they've all developed technologies that are being tested and if they look good, they'll be implemented through the Centers of Excellence, through the IMPROVE initiative. And as you talk about these um, deserts, the maternity deserts, I'm just wondering how do we get this new technology into those deserts? And do we have people 
who can assist with the implementation there? Yes, well, workforce is very important, yes. and workforce is not necessarily physicians. In fact, it's, it's a sad fact that in the last year, ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and, uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, report 10% fewer medical school graduates are going into OBGYN. So again, it's going to get worse. So we have to train other providers who, you know, have cars and will go into those rural areas, or, um, you know, we can train people in community hospitals and how they can use the point of care or the at-home data and then refer it into a medical center with trained specialists. Uh, but we, we have a serious workforce need, and that, again, is part of the IMPROVE initiative. You mentioned earlier about the community centers of excellence and utilizing members of the community. I know where my university is. We have a center for health disparities research. And when we go into the community, we utilize promotors. Um, are, do you have programs where you are actually training um, non-health professionals. Tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, so um, in the other challenge, we, we have the uh, community maternal health challenge. The centers of excellence are something else. Okay. The community health challenge uh, charge different community-based organizations to tell us what their needs were and then identify a plan. How do we make a change? So. Uh, staff educated them as to how to compete for funding. They've received prizes along the way. There have been multiple steps, and now they're down to the finalist phase as well, where they are implementing a specific approach in their community. A couple of them happen to, there, there are 10 finalists there too, and a couple of them also have doula programs where they are asking a research question, they're really asking how does the doula improve maternal health outcomes in that specific community. So have you um, seen enough studies or programs where you might be able to discuss some of the best practices or learnings from those programs? It's a little premature okay. because um, Really, the IMPROVE initiative uh, had this separate appropriation in the last fiscal year and this fiscal year. So the challenges are farther along, the technology challenge and the community challenge. Um, but we're not yet at the, the point of best practices. We will get there. And the intent is that these programs are going to be ongoing for seven years to really see what kind of difference it makes. I can give you a different example, though, where um, in prior research funded by NICHD in California, where you are, um, there was a specific uh, protocol used for women who were hemorrhaging at the time of delivery or afterwards. And there was a checklist, and there was a certain way to approach the problem. And uh, it definitely improved poor outcomes related to hemorrhage um, there was still a disparity for people of color, but they were improved, but not as much as the white people. But overall, using that checklist and that protocol really did make a difference. Yes. So this is implementation research. It's not you know, Nobel Prize winning basic science research, but very important in the community and it made a difference. Great. Now, um, with the community engagement, we talked a little bit about that, and you mentioned the differences in communities, obviously. The approaches and the lessons learned from your community engagement, what um, lessons learned might you share with us that might be implemented in other communities? Well, again, they're, they're just starting, but this is conceived as um, a fully integrated program whereby the, the knowledge from the communities will feed into the centers of excellence 
and there's also a data coordination hub and an implementation science hub. And the participants in the IMPROVE initiative can take advantage of all of those resources. And we're expecting that knowledge about the best practices will then be tested in a larger scale in the centers of excellence. Yeah. Let me um, shift to something that's um, near and dear to my heart. And that is um, maternal depression. Mm -hmm. It's um, one of the most common obstetric complications in the United States. Up to 20% of women will suffer from depression. And when we look at um, the perinatal period, we see um, higher rates of perinatal anxiety. What um, do you have uh, in the NICHD or with other collaborations? What do you um, feel that we need to be considering during this um, peri and postpartum period that may need more research to affect change? Yes. So this is an area that is you know, included in the IMPROVE initiative. Um, we do fund research in this area, as does the National Institute of Mental Health. But a big problem is finding the people who do need help. Um, many women feel like there's something wrong with them and they don't want to ask for help. I know that with the uh, Maternal Health Technology Challenge, one of the finalists has developed a, a, a phone app that screens women repeatedly for risk factors for depression or if they are actually experiencing depression. So the idea is to use research to identify the people who are affected and then get them to help. Um, so it, it's a real problem and it's somewhat of a silent problem because it's not acknowledged and people are ashamed to ask for help. You're supposed to, you know, you've, you have your bundle of joy and you're supposed to be so happy that you've now had your baby and why are you sad? And why can't you get out of bed in the morning? So we need to find these people and then get them to the appropriate treatment. So we're really focusing more on the identification and the diagnosis. And as a psychiatrist, I tend to think about um, using integrative care in settings where women are going to see their OBGYN physicians. But perhaps if we had a psychiatrist or psychologist embedded into that treatment, we might see more improvement in the depression, anxiety, or maybe less stigma about asking for help. Yes. What yes. are your thoughts in that area? Well, before I came to NIH, I was a practicing neonatologist and geneticist at Tufts University School of Medicine. And um, on the high-risk maternity team, we did have an embedded psychiatrist. The problem was that um, only the most affected people got to see her. If they were mildly affected or simply sad, they didn't. So. For whatever reason, she was there, but she was helping to take care of the people who were most affected. Do you think um, that was due to uh, insurance, or do you think it was just not being, the people were not being informed of the psychologists or the psychiatrists being there? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to say, because that was already six years ago, right. but um, you know, these were women who were hospitalized for pregnancy complications. Okay. Most likely they were either at risk of preterm delivery or they had high blood pressure and they were being treated for that. I, I worry most about the women who are the outpatients yeah. who yeah. are functioning, but only just so, and uh, they're, they're dragging. And, and we do need to keep track of these women because included in the maternal mortality rates are women who commit suicide and intimate partner violence. So 
you know, we have an issue there as well. Absolutely. And I was thinking with the integrative care, um, perhaps in the outpatient setting, we would um, have more progress in that area yes. to, to have integrated care. Um, we're down to the last question. Seems like time I know, just it flew by. Flew oh, by. Yeah, I see. <laughs> so, um, what are some of the, or maybe not some, but what's a main takeaway you'd like the audience to leave with today? Well, I think there are really two things. One is maternal death is a preventable problem. Like I said, 80% of deaths are preventable and even higher in American Indians and Alaska Natives, 93%. So we can solve this problem. Um, the second thing, as I mentioned, is that the majority of deaths are occurring postpartum. So most people think once you have the baby, the baby's thriving, the mother is discharged from the hospital, everything is hunky-dory. And a lot of symptoms are not connected to the pregnancy. So the second message is really if a postpartum woman is not feeling well. If she has a headache, that could be serious high blood pressure. So she needs to get to attention. So that's the second message. Well, Dr. Bianchi, thank you um, thank so you. much. And we're going to open for questions. I hope we have time for a question or two. Yeah. Yes. My question to you is, I'm very, obviously very distressed by the maternal mortality rate being as high as it is, and uh, America likes to be number one, but certainly not to be number one with maternal mortality. So I think the, the study that's being done at NICHD and, and, uh, and I, um, the Nursing Institute and Mental Health are very worthwhile and very, um, very important, but my question is, you spoke about the implementation science aspect. Am I to assume that the biology is understood, and there would, and or will there be some some attempt to, to try to understand causation before you begin with implementation science? Thank you, Dr. Reese, and he knows a lot more about obstetrics than I does than I do, since he's a practicing specialist in maternal fetal medicine. I said that. We're looking at basic, translational, and clinical. So we clearly need to understand mechanisms and causation for a number of these uh, issues. Um, but we also have to make a difference. And so that's why we are emphasizing in this particular initiative, implementation. Um, amongst our other scientific uh, portfolio, we have a lot of effort looking at basic science, reproductive science. And I didn't even get a chance to talk about our maternal fetal medicine units network, which is a network of sites around the country that can also study um, issues related to pregnancy. In fact, that unit, unit network um, was the one that really collected the data that showed that COVID is so much more serious in people who are pregnant. And if you were pregnant and got COVID, you were more likely to be in an ICU, be on a respirator, or actually die. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that we're ignoring basic science. It's just that in the IMPROVE initiative, there's a definite focus on implementation. Again, and the question I have relates to whether or not some health policy is included in the IMPROVE initiative. I hope I'm accurate in saying that a disproportionate number of births are women covered under the Medicaid program. And I've heard recently that while the baby may retain coverage for a longer period of time, that the woman might lose coverage in as few as 30 days. And if you're, you know, that brings up a whole lot of questions about ability to access care, for sure. And I just wonder if that's any part of the IMPROVE initiative? Yeah, so 50% of the births in the country are covered by state Medicaid programs. And it's been a big um, emphasis of the vice president's office, in particular, 
to increase postpartum coverage for up to 12 months. And um, they've been successful. I, I don't know the exact number today, but it was up to 38 uh, fairly recently. So it might be a little higher now, but that's a tremendous improvement even over the last year. And it's in recognition of the fact that so many of these complications are occurring after delivery. And this is their, the postpartum person's only access to, to insurance paid medical care. So if we have that state Medicaid program coverage for the first 12 months, hopefully we're gonna find these women before devastating complications occur. Well, Dr. Bianchi, thank you so, thank much. You so much. And we're really appreciative of all that you're doing and the great work of um, NICHD. Well, thank you, and thank you all for your interest in this important problem. Thank you. See you, Diana. Take care. Um, you gave us hope, I think. There was hope there. We can solve this problem. There's room for advocacy. We're about advocacy, as you know, but also for science. And I've got to say that just because there isn't a Nobel Prize for implementation research doesn't mean it shouldn't be recognized and celebrated and awarded. So somebody ought to get on that, I think. Now, we have a three minute, just three minutes, though, three minute break, stand up meet new friends uh, while we change over some things on the stage right now. I'll be right back. Started here in just a minute. 
So please return, please return to your seats. Either one, either one. So this is a very exciting piece of our program today. Um, uh, really, uh, words uh, speaking of prizes and recognition. So in early 2020, we all, the whole world indeed, was in need of a solution, <laughs> badly, badly solution um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pfizer, shifted the status quo, their status quo, to focus on achieving the impossible, it seemed impossible, simultaneously produce a vaccine and a treatment for COVID-19. And to do this in a time frame that was previously thought impossible. Of course, we, and along with the rest of the world, is watching this with intent interest. We wanted to find a way at Research America to honor and recognize true trailblazers in the COVID-19 pandemic, trailblazers who would then continue to blaze those trails and to triumph on behalf of us all, similar to pioneers at Pfizer. That kind of vision was the birth of Research America's 2023 Discovery Innovation Health Prize, generously supported by Pfizer. This prize recognizes and supports bold, innovative thinking, thinking and being personalized with a promising idea that will be applied to future pandemics. To hear more, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Annalisa Anderson, Senior Vice President and Head of Pfizer's Vaccine Research and Development. Annalisa. Thank you, uh, Mary, for the warm introduction. It's a real honor um, to be here today. Um, and I would like to thank Research America for convening us um, at this uh, excellent forum to celebrate science and the conversations that really matter to the work that we do. As Mary said, my name is Dr. Annalisa Anderson. I'm the head of vaccine research and development at Pfizer. And it's an honor to be here today representing Pfizer as we recognize the excellent work of Dr. Nevin Kogan um, and his bold vision for the future pandemic preparedness. Pfizer is deeply proud of the role that we played in the COVID-19 pandemic with the efforts to develop an RNA-based vaccine with BioNTech, as well as the work to develop the treatment uh, Paxlovid. These interventions helped change the trajectory of the pandemic, and it would not have been possible without the power of collaboration and partnership on a personal note, I'm humbled to have led the team of biologists that developed Paxlovid and also now to be responsible for vaccines research and development, ensuring that the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine is updated as new variants emerge, in addition to working on other potential life-saving vaccines. I'm also joined today um, by some of the colleagues who worked on the COVID-19 vaccine and um, they will be at the dinner this evening. So um, certainly look us out if, uh, if you see us. Um, today, though, I'm thrilled that we're um, placing um, collaboration and innovation front and center to recognize Dr. Krogan. The pandemic really showed us what is possible when companies, academics, and governments work together. Because as we all saw, and as we may see again, 
the greatest challenges are better tackled together. As the threat of new pathogens is ever present, so are the realities of potential future pandemics from emerging viruses and other pathogens. We now believe that pandemics are more likely to occur than previously thought, so it's vital that we maintain the momentum around pandemic preparedness. Looking ahead to future pandemics, we cannot risk being complacent or getting caught off guard. At Pfizer, we've taken several key steps to ensure that we're implementing learnings from COVID-19 to prepare for future disease outbreaks. We encourage other organizations, industries, and governments to join us in keeping pandemic preparedness front and for forefront, knowing that it's likely that we'll have to face the future health crisis together um, with coordinated action. The most significant learning that has been the global problems require global solutions and sustained collaboration. At Pfizer, we strive for breakthroughs that change patients' lives. The COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated the importance of collaboration and fast-paced innovation. And that's why it's crucial we continue cultivating a robust research and development ecosystem to help drive new breakthroughs. Pfizer has proudly sponsored the Discovery Innovation Health Prize because we want to encourage an accelerating groundbreaking pro progress. Innovative ideas, technologies, and approaches to solving some of our greatest global challenges, including any future pandemic. I'm honored to present the Discovery Innovation Health Prize to Dr. Nevin Krogan. So Dr. Krogan joined forces with the scientists around the world as the first group to extensively map the SARS-CoV-2 um, sequences um, to help find solutions to solve the problem. Now, Dr. Krogan is establishing the Center for Excellence, a global network with cross-sector, cross-disciplinary international collaboration that can help save countless lives. I'm looking forward to learning more from Dr. Krogan on this in a few minutes. This project has a bold vision for pandemic preparedness, ultimately aiming to curtail the course of disease and reduce the demands on medical care and costly isolation. It is our aspiration that this type of innovative thinking and collaborative design will hopefully improve our ability to share data, better equipping us to take swift coordinated action if faced with future pandemics. I'm looking forward to watching the capabilities and impact of this project expand and grow. On behalf of Pfizer and all of us here today, please, please join me in congratulating Dr. Krogan. This is such a wonderful honor for Research America, I know, for, and with our partnership with Pfizer. So we salute you. Thank you very much. Salute you, Nevin. Thank you. We got, okay. we got Thank pictures? You. Thank you. Okay. I, I also just should add that, um, although we're not going to make that presentation right up here, there's also a $200,000 um, award associated with this prize that will help support Dr. Krogan's work going forward. Congratulations. Well, thank you, um, Mary and Research America and Annalisa and Pfizer for this very um, humbling and prestigious award. I realize I'm getting singled out here for this, but I think it's fantastic that this award um, represents collaboration. So I'm up here, in my opinion, representing hundreds of scientists that have we've been working together over the last several years um, during the pandemic. So um, I am the director of the Quantitative Biosciences Institute at UCSF, and this was founded several years ago 
um, focused on collaboration, trying to break down silos, bring up individuals together that don't normally work together. So the, the Institute is really focused on different technologies. So we were spent a lot of time trying to connect uh, different individuals focused on different technologies. We then try to take those disease agnostic technologies and put them in the hands of scientists working on specific disease areas. Um, that's in the Bay Area and around the country. And we've also spent a lot of time making connections with institutions, both academics and industry, uh, around the world. And um, several years ago, the, uh, the chief operating officer and myself, uh, the CEO is Jacqueline Fabius, who is here uh, today, we traveled around the world and we made these connections uh, with different places around Europe, in Israel, South America, Asia, uh, and many places in Africa. So when the pandemic hit, I thought we were in a perfect position to leverage this network, uh, what we've built up in many different ways. So we were the first group in January 2020, to my knowledge, to clone out all of the 29 SARS-CoV-2 genes. And we just simply tweeted, we have these constructs, we have these plasmids, happy to send them out to whoever wants them free of charge, no MTAs, Lawyer, lawyers weren't coming to work anyway, so that was good. Um, <laughs> so we were able to send out these constructs to over 400 labs in 40 countries in, in, in a couple of weeks. And I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to get these reagents out to the community to help expedite uh, research on um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we worked with these, started with our lab, it extended to four labs at UCSF, then eight, then over 40 groups involving hundreds of different scientists, and then that extended to over 300 labs in 25 different institutions around the world in 16 different countries. And we had a number of very productive and unique relationships with industry partners um, as well. So uh, when the pandemic hit, we could look at our network and say, all right, who do we work with here? Well, two uh, spots that really jumped out at us was um, Paris and the Institut Pasteur and New York Mount Sinai Hospital. They had the virus growing, they had the virus propagating, we didn't at the time, but we had these great quantitative tools that we could use uh, to study the virus. So what did this all lead to? Well, a lot of great science, over 50 papers in, in, in less than two years, um, a lot of deep mechanistic studies of how the virus is coming in and hijacking and rewiring the, our proteins and complexes and pathways. That led to a number of clinical trials. Um, there's a couple still ongoing, one in uh, phase three, with a company in Spain. It also led to um, a large a grant from NIID, the biggest grant um, from, uh, that U University of California has ever uh, got, and uh, it's part of the AVID program. Um, and these are these antiviral centers. We were lucky to get one of these. Um, and this is focused on developing antivirals, not just for SARS-CoV-2, not just for other coronaviruses, but for other viruses that have pandemic potential. And we went in our network and we got 43 different labs around the world. We put them together for this particular uh, project. We have a retreat tomorrow we gotta get back to for, for that work. Um, and also what this led to, very excitingly for me, is the formation now of an Institute Pasteur QBI-UCSF center, which will hopefully turn into an institute very soon. There's 32 different Institute Pasteurs around the world. There's not one in the United States. There's gonna be one now in the Bay Area focused on um, pandemic preparedness. The idea is we're gonna be bringing the great expertise from the scientists at the Institute Pasteur on infectious disease combined with the quantitative approaches that we're pioneering at QBI and UCSF to build one of the preeminent um, pandemic preparedness institutes um, in the world. I've been uh, co-leading this with Carla Saleh at the Institute Pasteur. Uh, Celine, Celine Perrier, who's also here, is uh, helping uh, coordinate that. I should also point out that Jacqueline, Celine, and I work closely with Peggy Ackerberg, who's also here to coordinate um, uh, these efforts. So there's a lot of exciting things that have come out of the work that's gone on during the pandemic. So what does the future hold here now? Well, taking a few steps back, what have we learned and how can we apply it to the future? Look at all the exciting things that happened at Pfizer and elsewhere Oh, in a disease we didn't even know about a few years ago. Look how fast we could move when we all work together. So why can't we work on all diseases like this? Breast cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism. Uh, and I think we can. Uh, and the challenge here for the scientific community, in my opinion, is to keep this infrastructure al alive, keep the spirit alive, so we can tackle um, all diseases with the same um, speed. I think we can do this and I believe we will do this, and I'm very excited to be associated with those efforts. 
And just at the end, I just want to thank one more person here. That's uh, somebody that's been a cornerstone at UCSF for um, many years. He's a presence here in DC. He's an advocate for UCSF and an advocate for science in general for many years. I'm my close friend and mentor, Keith Yamamoto. So thanks, Keith. And we were having beers a couple weeks ago, and I actually thought of something that I didn't tell him. I'll just I'll tell all, you, all of you. He's been a professor at UCSF longer than I've been alive. <laughs> and that's a compliment, Keith. So <laughs> I mean it as a compliment. So um, we're here. The team's here. Keith and I are here with Peggy and um, Celine and Jacqueline. So please come and talk to us uh, this afternoon and at the dinner if you're coming to learn about what we were doing before the pandemic, what we're doing during the pandemic, and what our future goals are. So again, thank you for, to Research America and, and uh, Pfizer for this event, for your time and effort, for the funding, and for this award. Thank you very much. Terrific. I even like the looks of the prize. It looks cool. Yeah, very cool. All right. Compliments. Compliments to the prize team. Okay. Um, we have a very short break. We, again, have to switch out some chairs here. But don't go away, because we have a fabulous um, final um, pr um, program uh, session that does involve innovation and partnerships. It builds beautifully on what we just heard from Dr. Krogan. So I'll be right back with you. No need to clap. <laughs>
Hello, we're back. And um, it's, it's going to be something that you're glad you stayed for. A great session to be on innovative partnerships. So on our panel at, will be Dr. Renee Wegerson, the director, the first director, the founding director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, or ARPA-H. Dr. Gary Disbro, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and Director of the Biomedical, Res Biomedical Advanced Research and Development A Authority, or BARDA. And Sally Elaine, Regional Head, J Labs at Washington, D.C., Johnson & Johnson Innovation. And the session will be moderated by Maya Goldman, health reporter and co-author for Axios Vitals newsletter at Axios. Maya, over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. It's great to be here. I'm very excited to talk to this esteemed panel and um, to be here with you all today. Um, I would love to start just you know, to level set a little bit um, to maybe do a quick rundown of what innovative partnership means to, to all of you, because um, that's what we're here to talk about today. So maybe, Sally, we can start down there and then just go along the line. Uh, thank you. Uh I'm from Johnson Johnson Innovation. I'm head of JLabs here at Washington, D.C. And I think as we think about accelerating great science and technology, we know we can't do that alone um, and that we really have to partner and, and bring a lot of tools to the toolbox from our toolbox and from our partner's toolbox uh, to support and, and really accelerate great science and technology. Renee, what about you? Great. Renee Ferguson of ARPA-H. And for, for me, innovative partnerships really um, brings a lot of creativity. So we love working with non-traditional partners. Uh, we love talking with Sherry and, and her team just about um, all the ways that, that we could take really big risks in health that we might not be able to do in, in other parts of the ecosystem. And Gary Disbro from BARDA, I agree with Renee. I think a central role of the federal government is to actually spur innovation, uh, to support um, development of, of products and innovative technologies where there is a potential market failure or you know, there's an unmet medical need. Um, sometimes it's too risky for larger corporations to invest in those technologies, and I think the federal government can play a central role in that. Yeah, absolutely. And so to, to kick us off, um, as you both mentioned, BARDA and ARPA-H both have this uh, core value of innovation through partnership. So I would love to hear a little bit more about what that looks like within each of your individual um, agencies. So Gary, why don't you kick us off? Okay, great. So several things, um, you know, at the core of BARDA's mission is public-private partnership. And so there are several things that we have initiated, um, you know, to make it easier for companies to partner with us. Um, starting back in 2016 when we established um, the Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria um, Accelerator that, was, that came out of the PACCARB recommendation from the White House. And this was a novel mechanism. We partnered with Boston University. We originally were partnered with the NIAID, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as well as Wellcome Trust to reinvigorate the pipeline for, AM, for AMR. Um, most large pharmaceutical companies were exiting that space. They did not see a return on investment. We, see, we saw that as an unmet medical need. And so we established that um, accelerator, which is now international. We have uh, investments from the UK government, uh, the Germany, uh, government of Germany, as well as Canada, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so that is a unique partnership um, that we are supporting uh, for the production, or sorry, development of, of AMR drugs, <laughs> vaccines, and diagnostics. Another thing that we did in 2018 was established a division within BARDA, the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures. Um, that is the innovative arm of the BARDA organization. Um, we have several things under that division that really um, inter you know, support interaction with small innovative uh, companies. The first one is we have a broad agency announcement, and it is termed the EASY, B-A-A, and E, Z is in Zeta, um, B-A-A, but it's very simple for companies who are interested in partnering with the federal government to submit an abstract. We review it very quickly. We get them information back. Um, if we're interested, they submit a full proposal. We can fund it. It's a limit of up to $750,000, but we do ask for, ask for a cost share. 
but it allows for very quick uh, funding to these innovative companies who can't wait and go through the bureaucracy that's associated with typical government funding. Um, some of the people that we invested in uh, for the EZBA were complaining that we didn't have a transition uh, because our next funding stage was advanced research and development, but they may not have enough data from that EZBA to go into advanced research and development. So we listened to them and we set up an EZBA 2.0, which now can provide up to $20 million to people who are successful um, in the EZBA before they're ready for advanced research and development. Another thing that we did is we have a special authority under the 21st Century Cures Act, and I promise I'll talk, stop giving <laughs> people all the time, um, for uh, partnering with a venture capital firm. So Barta Ventures was launched in 2021. We are partnered with the Global Health Investment Corporation, which allows us to transfer funds to them. They are a venture capital firm. They can take an equity position in uh, companies which the U.S. government cannot. And then finally, under our dry program, we have our Blue Knight program, which is our partnership uh, with J-Labs. That's located right here in Washington, D.C. at Children's National Hospital. We offer lab space um, to companies who are partnered with us. Um, and the other thing that I'll mention is for all of these programs, whether you're early research and development, advanced research and development, or late stage development, BARTA supports you through a project coordination team with our subject matter expertise so that we can focus you on product development and move those products forward. Thanks. Fabulous. Renee, how does it work in ARPA-H? Well, I, I love Gary's examples because I can piggyback off them a little bit. Uh, the CARBEX example, really creating almost mm -hmm. an ecosystem around an, an entire concept that eventually goes global. Um, we really want to create that across uh, the entire health ecosystem. And uh, it, it, our dollars at ARPA-H aren't linked to a specific disease or a specific technology, really have this broad aperture. The way that we approach projects, um, there's kind of two primary levers. One is via our program managers. And these are folks that, that we find um, out there in the ether that you know, have these great CVs, they're doers in their field, but they come to ARPA-H with a very specific problem in mind that they want to solve. And we give them a term limited appointment, three years to start. So every two weeks that goes by, 1% of their time is up <laughs> and they're, they're really sprinting at solving this challenge. Uh, we've launched two programs so far. Uh, Nitro is an, a program focused on osteoarthritis and reversal of, uh, of degenerative kind of bone and cartilage uh, disease. Uh, and then the second is Psy, Precision Surgical Interventions. I didn't know coming into this role that that would be our first two programs, but it really is. Uh, we're a snapshot of our program manager. So uh, we have eight program managers in-house right now. We hope to hire 20 by the end of the year. We're on track to do so. So uh, you know, check in in December, we should have maybe 20 different projects to talk, talk about. So that, that's really on the programs and the program manager side. The other way that we uh, fund innovation is through our open broad agency announcement. And so uh, it's not quite the easy BAA. We, 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 we don't have a set uh, ceiling on our awards. Uh, although we only have a $2.5 billion appropriation, so there is a limit to the funds. Uh, but, but we're really open to projects, uh, large or small, and we set the bar at a three-pager to start. And so that this is a simple point of entry for if you're an academic group or a small company to get that initial feedback from ARPA H if there's a concept there that we're excited about to be able to develop that and, and bring it further. Yeah, absolutely. And Sally, we got a little teaser about J Labs and Project Blue Knight. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, how JLabs works mm -hmm. and how you leverage these public par private yeah, partnerships? Absolutely. Uh, so Johnson Johnson Innovation, J Labs, uh, to give you an idea of what we do. Uh, so we are a no strings attached uh, life science healthcare incubator. Uh, we launched the model business model launched 10 years ago in San Diego. Uh, we now have over 12 locations around the world uh, where we will support early stage entrepreneurs and innovators, early stage companies, um, and give those companies uh, big pharma opportunities uh, and resources. So that not only are we providing turnkey facilities for companies to walk into, have access to capital equipment, specialized instrumentation, uh, but we're also providing expert mentorship to the companies that incubate with us so that we can really ensure that these entrepreneurs um, can put their capital towards driving their research, not worrying about, I need a fridge and a freezer at $10,000, $20,000, $100,000. Uh, so just to give you an idea, since J Labs was launched um, 10 years ago, we've incubated over 960 companies. Uh, speaking about that no strings attached, 48 companies have been acquired. 
not by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, more than 50 have IPO'd, and those companies have raised over $91 billion uh, in financing and strategic partnerships. Uh, so we know the model works. Um, I think it's, it's showing how we need to really bring what we can uh, that we know is really important uh, as far as expertise um, and then also resources. Uh, so how can we bring a community of resource providers together? Um, how can we make those network connections to investors? Um, how can we amplify um, this great science and technology um, so that those that are investing or those that are partnering um, know about these companies? And, um, and we do that uh, through an interactive, actually, dashboard. Uh, you go to Johnson Johnson Innovation uh, dot com slash navigator, it's a highly interactive dashboard. So anyone can look at any of the companies, where they are, what the stage is, what they're working on, um, unless they're working in stealth. Uh, so that's a great tool. But to highlight, I think, the, the important public-private partnership here and why we're here together to talk about is, is the Blue Knight opportunity. So in 2019, <laughs> What year? Um, we signed, so Johnson Johnson Innovation and J Labs signed a partnering agreement with BARDA uh, to work with early stage companies. Um, that was pre pandemic, uh, very um, interesting inflection point. Um, and then 2020, uh, we, we really doubled down as two organizations um, to enhance uh, the partnership and launching Blue Knight. So thinking about um, how do we anticipate the next global health threats? How do we um, pull together um, an ecosystem of companies working in great science and technology? Um, and then how do we amplify um, all of that work? Um, since that partnership initiated, there are now over 39 companies in the portfolio globally, not just not in the United States. Um, we've under that partnership, uh, there's been a number of opportunities such as quick fire challenges uh, where there's been non-dilutive grant funding awarded. Um, just to highlight an incredible opportunity uh, that was announced this year was a deployment of $10 million uh, to companies selected uh, for, to, to move some of these um, assets forward, preclinical and then clinical assets as part of the, the project Next Generation in response to, to COVID. Um, so a lot of opportunities here. We bring together the ecosystem every year for Blue Knight on a very large symposium. So again, really showcasing um, and accelerating the science and technology. And where does the, the name Blue Knight come from? Do either of you know the answer to that? <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. So so the color blue is supposed to be safe yep. and you know the night obviously to protect um but it was you know something that we came up with different logos i mean obviously um the j labs team um but i th i thought it was perfect um and also the blue matches the bar of blue too so. yeah it's a great shield logo um yeah. and branding and, and it's gary highlighted um so j labs of washington dc is is the hub for blue night I think it's uh, perfectly p placed. Companies can and meet with one-on-one uh, -on -one in person uh, with barter mentorship and Johnson and Johnson mentorship. Um, but then thinking about sort of what would resonate around the world in this knight in shining armor opportunity. Very nice, um, Renee. I know you have a background in both private sector and public sector. Um, how does partnership look different from those sides of the coin? And, and what did you learn you know, in, in your um, public service role that you brought to Ginkgo and, and then from Ginkgo, which is where Renee worked before ARPA-H, right? Mm -hmm. um, from Ginkgo to ARPA-H. Yeah, so, so before I became a program manager at DARPA, I was, I was in the private sector, so I had a little bit of a flavor for the, the startup world. And you know, coming into to DARPA, um, was was really my first you know big government experience, and that was uh, it was just incredible the amount of resources that you had available and the autonomy and the decision making. You can get really spoiled having a job <laughs> like that in government, not uh, you know recognizing that not all of government is like that because 
you know, the way it works to be a program manager is that program manager really assumes um, all of the risk, but they're also the decision maker for that, that program. They take in, uh, uh, you know, perspective from subject matter experts, but the way they can take risk is because, because that decision making authority lies with them. Um, which is just a, a really incredible opportunity. So I really appreciated that piece of it and seeing how, how quickly government can work um, in that domain. Uh, what I recognized though as a, as a program manager is um, not everybody knows how to work with government. And so uh, if you spend any amount of time in government over time, you're like, okay, here's the usual suspects applying for this proposal because they know how to do it and they have machines that sort of help them do that. And so reaching those non-traditional partners um, is very, very challenging, I think, um, both for, for those partners, but for the government as well. So now, when I went to um, the private sector, and you know, this was, I, I went in August of 2020, so really middle of the pandemic, um, and I worked, uh, interestingly, on COVID response to uh, K-12 classrooms, but also to airports. And so working with non-traditional partners in that setting, um, uh, you know, really curiously, those that had concessions agreements in an airport, um, think Express Spa, who now their business model kind of dried up. Nobody wants a massage when you're wearing a mask and, and are worried about COVID, but now they had people that could, could uh, you know, provide um, some health care interactions through testing in an airport. That type of non-traditional thinking was, was just like so empowering and was what you needed to kind of close the loop on genomic surveillance for, for travelers in that case. And so um, that whole process of setting up those contracts in that case with the CDC um, was, was just so enlightening of uh, here's a biotech company working with this non-traditional concessions partner who would have never worked with biotech you know, you know, six months earlier. Um, and that was just such a neat model of like, how do we re repeat that? Because so much of healthcare in the United States in rural settings, the more that we can tap into those non-traditional partners, the better. Um, I learned a, a statistic recently, which is 150 million Americans live closer to a Walmart mm -hmm. <laughs> than they do a, a, a community care center, which is just astonishing. And so we're not leveraging all the resources out there. And so um, I'm just really energized by this opportunity to come to ARPA H and work with some of those non-traditional partners and think about creative ways that, that we can you know, bring solutions to the American people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and speaking of COVID, Gary, I know um, you were, uh, overseeing Operation Warp Speed um, during, during the pandemic. And what, um, what did you learn about partnership from that experience? Uh, so General Perna oversaw Operation Warp Speed. We, <laughs> BART played a large part. I think, you know, when there really is such a global pandemic, um, what private industry and the government can do when they work together. Um, you know, it was, I could tell you stories about, you know, it was, it was 24 seven for, you know, two and a half plus years, uh, and that's, you know, weekends, holidays, um, but it was just amazing. And not only the developers of the vaccines and the therapeutics and the diagnostics, but the private sector, you know, FedEx, UPS, the pharmacy channels, I mean, all had to work together to make this happen. I mean, it was one thing to do the clinical trial. It was another to make sure that we had doses that were manufactured and that could be shipped out, which occurred at the end of 2020. Um, but getting those doses to where they needed to be to make sure that the people had needles and syringes and all the ancillary supplies. It's just, it really shows the power of what we can do when we all work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What lessons should we take from that experience? How can we, how can you use that um, in, in other settings? So I, I, you know, part of it was, you know, the companies were being altruistic. I mean, they knew that they had vast resources. It's how do we entice both large, small, uh, you know, as well as medium-sized companies to want to partner with the federal government. And hopefully um, some of the lessons learned from the company side is that the government is not such a bad partner. Um, yes, we have a lot of bureaucracy, um, but when we need to, we can move very quickly. And so hopefully that opened the door for others to see that the U.S. government actually can be a good partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Sally, you also facilitate at JLab's partnerships, you know, not just with the government, with academia and with other industry organizations mm -hmm. and corporations. What's the difference between working with the government and, and with other partners? And what can you learn from, from working with other partners? 
So much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, well, first of all, so to put it in perspective, um, the agreement that was put in place with J and J Innovation, J Labs, and Barta was done in six weeks. That which was just astounding on both sides. Um, I mean, we're a big pharmaceutical company. There's a lot of people we have to walk a square and get approvals on for for that type of agreement. Um, but it, it shows that um, if you've got the right people behind it and can stay really nimble um, and really live into the purpose, um, you can make those things happen. Um, I think we're, what we're always doing is, is looking for opportunities and partnerships um, that make things simple. Um, how can we drive partnerships um, with academic institutions um, to support early entrepreneurs? Or how could we partner um, across the states um, so that the states are, organizations are leveraging state funding dollars to support entrepreneurs, and then how, what can we bring to the table um, as, as opportunities as well. Um, I think, actually, I'm gonna use ARPA-H as, as an example here um, of what you've already done in the ecosystem, Renee and, and your team. So there was a call put out for the ARPA-H hub locations. Um, and what this generated across the United States are consortiums of partners. Um, and this was part of the application of where are the next ARPA-H hubs going to be placed. Um, and what this did is, although there were consortiums all over the United States, um, North Te Texas, Houston, the East Coast, California, um, but what it created is a, a mechanism by all of these uh, partners coming together, potential partners, I should say, um, to put in a, an application um, that maybe hadn't been previously linked. Um, and how do we all work together to potentially win for this ARPA-H hub in our, our regional location? Some of those hubs um, that were down-selected that did not move forward, or those consortiums, I should say, are still now talking about, okay, what can we still do together? So it's, it's that opportunity and recognition um, that there's a lot of value there um, uh, working to access federal dollars to put to work um, to drive science, healthcare, innovative technologies. Yeah, and what about um, in the government working with other uh, offices across HHS or across the administration um, or even with Congress? What, what does that kind of partnership look like? Renee, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, I, I mean, we really are part of, of the ecosystem. So, you know, our, our patients, healthcare providers, those are our customers the industry, academia, those that we fund, but really importantly, our, our federal partners. And so, um, you know, for us, we are technology development focused. Um, however, we know that technology doesn't make it into the real world without regulation, without payers. And so uh, we do need FDA, CMS at the table. Um, NIH is, is a really critical partner for us. So, so you know, the world-class expertise that we have access to that uh, can help us as we shape some of our projects um, is astounding. We have, again, I'll say we have seven program managers in-house compared to uh, this giant NIH ecosystem that we can really tap into is such, such an advantage for us. Um, we've really been intentional about visiting um, uh, different geographies in the United States. We just got back from Chicago recently as an example, and there we engage with the, the, the regional workforce from HHS, so there's, there's 10 uh, you know, regional hubs for HHS, and so they provide us sort of that entryway and, uh, and first introductions to a, a given region, whether it's biotech companies or it's local hospitals um, that have really just been, been empowering uh, for us as we go forward. And you know, we're excited, we're just getting started. I'm still learning about nooks and crannies of HHS that I didn't know existed, and I'm sure I, I'll still learn more, but it's, um, you know, we really are trying to make this a partnership because at ARPA-H, um, anything we fund is a transaction. We are not a long-term funder. Um, we, wanna, we wanna be there to you know, bring certainty to things that look uncertain today, to show that, that um, uh, you know, a proof is there, there's, there's a possibility moving forward, and then we need to hand it off. And so, um, you know, whether that is uh, HHS or it ends up being even the, the private sector as an advanced developer, that's, mm -hmm. we're thinking about that even before we launch projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gary, does it look any different at BARDA? It, very similar, I mean, we're actually a transition partner for programs that uh, have a start at NIH or DOD. 
Um, and so we work very closely with our NIH partners, obviously, as they're looking at investments that they're going to make in their portfolios, as well as DARPA, DITRA, JPO um, as a potential transition partner. As Renee said, I mean, all of our products need to have regulatory approval, so obviously FDA uh, plays a critical role. Um, CDC plays a critical role because many of the things that we're developing are for the U.S. government only. They develop clinical guidance uh, for the use of those products. Um, so it really is a collaborative effort. Um, I saw, you know, I, I would say pre-COVID, maybe a little more on the siloed end of things, um, but during COVID, there was no silos. I mean, everybody just worked together. It didn't matter who you were, you were HHS. It didn't matter if your badge said NIH or BARDA or whatever. Um, and now you still see some of those cl close collaborations that were formed during COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely in my work reporting on HHS, you really see those silos and um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's exciting to hear that those might be coming down a little bit. Um, why, let's talk about flexibility and adaptability. You touched on this with Operation Warp Speed, but how, how can you stay nimble during public-private partnerships um, when there is so much bureaucracy, both on the corporate side and the government side? Um, how, how does that work and how can that be better? I'd love to hear from you all on this. So maybe Sally, if you want to start. Yeah, I, I think alliance management is, I think, key to the, the public-private partnerships or I think any big collaborations is, is, is making sure that, that there's transparency there um, and having those conversations on, on deliverables, aims, um, s staying up to date on, um, you know, working against um, some of the, the, the aims and of those partnerships, um, pivoting. Um, and I think even Blue Knight um, each year, um, I would say actually mm -hmm. probably more than each year, sort of biannually there's this constant check-in of what else can we do, what more can we do, and, and that's um, been evident to the additional funding um, BARDA has provided to, to the companies and the, and the portfolio. Um, so I think that's in incredibly important. Um, I think as you highlighted, staying nimble. So how do we, how do we decrease um, the bureaucracy? Um, how do we make things simpler? Um, certainly for, for those that we are trying to support and advance. Um, you think of entrepreneurs and early stage companies, um, you know, it's really challenging to, to navigate uh, big, big pharmaceutical companies. It's challenging to navigate um, big federal institutions. Um, one way we, we're getting around that is, is how do we will advocate on behalf of these companies, help them navigate. Um, all of our companies that are in our JLab's portfolio have mentorship from within J and J, and so we help navigate um, how we can get more information for them and provide again insights into um, what we know in disease areas or or development of, of, of project plans or on regulatory where we can. Um, so I think some of those aspects are, are really important. Yeah, Renee, do you have anything to add? I mean, and the topic of flexibility, um, I, I, I talked a little bit about the program manager model where, where we put a lot of autonomy um, with that, that individual, um, which I think brings a lot of flexibility. Uh, it's important to know that at ARPA-H, we don't issue grants. Uh, it, we have other transactions. We have contracts, cooperative agreements. A lot of that is not only that we can be flexible in the terms um, and the, the statement of works that we put forward, but also so that uh, we have a seat at the table so we want it to be a value add to work with government. And so maybe similar to, to some of the things that, that you mentioned, uh, you know, we can help convene FDA. We can bring CMS to the table. Um, we can bring other funders to the table. And we really want to empower the companies, the academic groups that, that we fund uh, to, to enjoy in the ecosystem that, 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 that we can help them connect with. And I do think that's a really big part of it. Um, for our programs, any one program manager is trying to solve a given problem, and they'll select three or four teams that they, they kind of put head to head. It's a, it's a bit of a co-opetition, right? They're working together, but at the end of the day, um, there typically is a down select as we move uh, towards the end of that program to get to that, that solution. And so, um, you know, being able to pivot and make sure that we're using those taxpayer resources most effectively is also a really key part of that program manager's role during, during the course of a project. Yeah. 
agree with everything that's been said. The only thing I might add is, you know, adding to what Renee said is, look at it from their perspective. I mean, they need flexibilities, they need quick responses. I mean, you know, many of these companies are, you know, living on the buying, needing that funding from the government. Obviously, we need to do our due diligence and everything, but also is really forming the partnership so that the company trusts you and you can trust the company so that if something does arise, it's a discussion and a determination of can we overcome that hurdle, and if not, then we need to have a more serious discussion. But, you know, they really want to be value added to us and for us to be value added to them. And I think that is the most important thing is that it's a true partnership and not just a contractual mechanism. You know, here's your money, here are your deliverables, you know, cost schedule performance. Things are gonna go wrong during product development. You have to be able to assess with the company whether you can overcome that and move forward. Yeah, speaking of problems, what, uh, what do you think are the greatest challenges facing public-private partnerships right now and, and how can we overcome them? Um, maybe Renee, you want to start, and we can go out. <laughs> Just one. Um, so, so you can list as many from, as you right. want. <laughs> well, um, I mean, for 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 me, maybe uh, I'll, I'll give a unique perspective from the ARPA H um, role that I have now. Is not a lot of people know that we exist, right? So what what I um, enjoyed when I was in the Department of Defense working with DARPA. Um, it's a 65-year-old organization, so you just say DARPA, and you don't have to finish the sentence. People understand your business approach. Um, in, in the health domain, not only do they not know about ARPA-H, they also don't know about DARPA. Um, and so getting folks familiar with the business model and, uh, and getting them to believe you that this <laughs> business model now exists in government has, has been actually a surprising challenge. Uh, but, but once they buy in, I mean, I, I think we've been able to move uh, you know, really quickly. I do think that sort of the, the next tier of challenges that we're going to face is, is really um, you know, looking at things like data sharing and doing that um, while you know, maintaining privacy but having uh, maximum access to that data, um, especially as we bring on a lot of new AI capability is something that um, I think is, you know, you're starting to, to hear that, that drum beat. And so I think we're still, as a government, figuring out how we're going to address that. And, and you can see the White House is really you know, convening a lot of folks to, to, to think you know, really intentionally about how do we do this in the, in the best way possible while, while protecting that privacy, but really leaning into the capability at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sally, mm -hmm. what do you think? I think there's certainly room for more public-private partnerships. I, I, I think seeing the, the opportunity um, in the private market for, um, you know, just, I think an example of what, what we've been able to do at, at J&J Innovation and, and with BARDA is, has been, I think, um, I'm, I'm biased, <laughs> but it's been pretty <laughs> remarkable. And, um, and, and helping these entrepreneurs, again, navigate um, what looks very challenging from a, how do I apply for federal grants? How, beyond the, the SBIR, um, which is an incredible mechanism for fueling innovation in the US marketplace, but just doing the easy BAAs, um, helping companies with further grant applications, um, and and working with you, with your group, um, and I think there's there's room for so much more. Um, I think there's room for um, multiple private um, organizations to partner, and then as and then to partner with with the federal government. Um, but you know, I think. We saw how the federal government uh, did a lot of work on the COVID side um, with the private market. Um, so we know it works, it can work pretty well. Um, but I think as we think about moving forward, there's, there's certainly a lot of more room uh, for further partnering. Gary, any thoughts? And I know we're short on time, so just <laughs> un uncertainty of, sorry, uncertainty of government funding, mm -hmm. um, I think is the biggest risk. You know, so many of the companies we work with wanna know um, that there's the funding available for the entire period of the contract if they're successful. For us, we do procurement, uh, so companies need to know, you know, you're gonna procure X millions of doses over, you know, how many ever years so that they can set up that manufacturing schedule. So I think that's the biggest issue, um, you know, on both sides because it's hard for us. We try to be a good partner, but, you know, we're currently facing a situation of uncertainty right now, um, so it's hard for our partners. 
speaking of, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. We uh, you know, are coming up on the end of the fiscal year and the government is not funded yet. So what happens to BARDA and ARPA-H um, if, if there's a government shutdown? Gary? So we fortunately have multi-year money. We have X-year funding. Um, you know, through two of our programs, we have two-year money, which means it carries over to next fiscal year. And then we have COVID supplemental funds that don't expire until the end of fiscal year 25. So um, we will have a reduced workforce, but for those mission critical activities, we can continue uh, those forward. I think we're in a similar spot. We have, we have three year dollars at ARPA H, but that doesn't mean that, that we're safe, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it really hurts that there's a government shutdown. Okay. Um, uh, all of this entire ecosystem that we're reliant on is, is, uh, is going to be impacted. And so, uh, you know, for, for something as uh, nonpartisan as healthcare, you know, really, uh, we, we hope to see a, a quick resolution to that. And just real quick, I know we're out of time, but Gary, how do you decide what's mission critical? Um, obviously, clinical studies, non-clinical studies, anything that's unethical, um, things that are, you know, national security, much of what we do is national security, but if there were deliveries that were coming, um, those would have to, you know, continue uh, to the strategic council. Stockpile, and as Renee said, you know, even though BARDA may be able to do certain things, processing invoices goes through a different system, and those people may not be there. Travel is impacted, um, you know, HR is impacted. Um, so it's going to be very difficult. Thank you so much to all of you. I know um, we have some time set aside for audience questions. Um, does anyone? Yes, right there. Yeah, I'm a New Yorker, so I might not need the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Weber, a quick question. Um, in, in recruiting for project managers, and I know that often they will be coming to you, are you looking at all in the global arena against global threats? Since your model is so unique, kind of mm -hmm. fast to fail, big bolus of dollars, um, has that been on your radar screen yet? It's, it's certainly within scope. So we haven't proactively uh, done a, a global hunt for program managers. So you may be familiar with, with Welcome Leap, uh, who does have kind of a global mandate in, in a more of an ARPA model. But, but we're absolutely open to that. And we, we uh, actually just this week, our, our head of uh, our international team started. So we're starting to build out that strategy. I made an early executive decision to just say, all right, we just got to stand up this agency and we're going to yes. think about like next quarter our international strategy, but global health will absolutely be a part of that for sure. If you know somebody, please, please send them our way. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's a question right there. Fry with the MIT Washington office. I have a question largely targeted towards Renee, but uh, Sal Sally or Gary, if either of you have input, that would be very welcome. Um, when I'm talking with the other um, folks at you know, smaller universities, emerging research um, institutions, small companies, a lot of them when I talk about ARPA-H are saying, I didn't even think that was an option for me. So um, there are, they say, I'm not sure I have the infrastructure or the resources to even apply or manage that kind of award. Yeah. What is uh, um, uh, something that you know, I can say to those people and I'm trying to like talk up this new opportunity that I can say, no, this could be an option for you if you have folks that can apply for it. Yeah, well, absolutely. We, we don't want to, uh, we really are open to anyone and are trying to be as easy as possible to work with. So. Our open broad agency announcement is a great example of uh, the, the barrier to entry is a three pager. So you don't have to have, uh, to even have the initial conversation, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, deep bench in terms of your, your grant making offices. I will say um, we did do an ecosystem trip to Atlanta and we visited the Atlanta University Center which has Spelman College, Morehouse College, Morehouse University and um, we were really struck by, uh, you know, we asked the question, why, why don't you typically work with ARPAs? But it really was, uh, they're not equipped, uh, at least in, in, that, in those school systems, to, to work um, on some of those big contracts with an ARPA. And that was a, a, a lesson that we took back to our contracting team uh, that I think, you know, matches the creativity of our program managers. And we're trying now to think about what are some creative ways that, uh, you, you know, maybe more of the non-traditional universities and, and partners will be able to work with ARPA-H. That's one piece of it. Um, this ARPANET H that, that um, was alluded to that, that we're launching next week, stay tuned, not Tuesday, we'll announce um, our, where our, our hub sites will be, but it really is meant to 
um, stimulate an ecosystem across all 50 states, and all of those interactions with our partners are through other transactions. And so those, that's meant to be kind of the, the simplest contracting vehicle, seven day turnaround. And so uh, we really are trying to put all of those pieces in place for those partners. So please, Hannah, send them our way for sure. <laughs> Anything else to add from you, maybe? I can just add a couple of things. So, you know, similar to what uh, ARPA H is doing, we have 13 accelerator um, located throughout the United States. We're also partnered with J Labs. They have other facilities or locations throughout the U.S. So there is outreach um, because you know we did the hub and spoke model because we're in D.C. Not a lot of people, um, you know, especially the universities, are used to dealing with um, Washington. So we set that system up. We also have a tech watch program. If you're interested in potentially partnering with BARDA, you can register for it on our website. You come in and have a conversation with us. You present your science. We'll have a frank discussion with you. It used to be BARDA-centric, but all through COVID, we included the rest or the vast majority of the um, federal government. And so now there's anywhere between you know 50 to 150 people on those calls listening to the science. If it's not an exact fit for BARDA, there are other f funding agencies that are at the table that may be able to partner with them. Yeah, and if I can just add too, it's, and we know it, at J&J that ideas are gonna come from wherever and anywhere, not just necessarily you know, the three big biotech hubs in the United States. And so we know we have to embed ourselves into all of the ecosystems to really find great science, great technology, um, entrepreneurs that are addressing issues that have been not addressed um, for many, many years as well. So we, we have purposely placed, so Johnson Johnson Innovation, our external innovation arm um, is placed throughout the United States and, and also in Asia Pacific and, and EMEA so that we're constantly landscaping, ensuring we've, we're touching um, a lot of academic institutions, um, research institutions, and other organizations. I think that's really important versus the idea that um, every great entrepreneur is going to come out of the Bay Area or Boston. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the time we have, but thank you so much. It was great to talk to you all. Thank you for listening, and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> Good to see you. Well, that, I, I just thought that was very exciting, and it's the kind of conversation that wouldn't have happened not that many years ago, and I look forward to what we're going to hear next year, the year after, from the kinds of innovative thinking and more and more partnerships, public-private partnerships, partnerships across all previous boundaries. Uh, we do need more partnerships, and I think they're coming. I hope that this forum has provided you some ideas for new partnerships. And as a way to um, explore those further, we encourage you to join us across the street for a reception now to um, explore these ideas, uh, meet new friends, um, get to know some of the people who you heard from today. Um, Thank you for being with us. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors and partners, which you can see uh, listed shortly, we'll see, listed here. And thank you to our board of directors, the Research America board of directors, who inspire us every day and are there for us and support our work. And thank you to the spectacular team that works so hard, I must say, all year round, to put this program together. And that's a lot of people, I won't name them all, but I wanna give a special tip of the hat to Sarah Chang. Sarah, wave your hand, you've seen her running around. And <laughs> Sheila Murphy. So thank you and thanks to all of our colleagues. This program and the one yesterday will um, be available to you in 
the, the whole program or little bits and pieces through um, Research America's outreach on various kinds of media. And I encourage you and others in your institutions, in your family, among your friends, anybody who would like to dip in and um, rehear the programs you thought were fabulous or, the, or check out the ones you missed. And give us feedback so that when we're putting a program together next year, we're sure to cover the issues and talk to the people that you want to hear from. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us across the street. Thank you who are members of Research America. And Thank you to all of us who are looking for the solutions to what ails us and finding them sooner rather than later. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>